Hey everyone, this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is brought to you by Automatic. Norm, what's Automatic? Uh, Automatic is a small device that you plug into your car. Uh, it can be an automatic car or a manual car. It's a device we actually we've both tested and currently use. Uh, what it does is it uh, reports on your car's diagnostics. You know what I like most about it? There's two things. One, you can press a button that gets rid of the check engine light if it's just something minor that you don't need to fix. And two, it makes it really easy to track mileage when you need to expense mileage in your car. That's right. So it pairs with an app on your phone, then that gives you uh, not real-time telemetry, but uh, after your drive, you can tell you know where your routes were, what your expected gas mileage was for that trip. Whether you braked too hard or accelerated too hard during the drive. And if you are the kind of person that parks your car and then leaves it for like three days and can't remember where you parked it, it'll even tell you where your car's parked. Yep. Uh, the product is 100 bucks, but if you use the podcast offer, you can actually get 20% off. That's considerable. Uh, no subscription fees at all. Just go to automatic.com slash test, T-E-S-T, and there's free shipping. Ships in two business days. You get a 45-day return policy. It is awesome. We like it. Automatic.com slash test. Uh, and now, on with the show. start the show it's august 27th 2015 welcome to this is only a test the official podcast of tested.com I'm Will Smith. Joining me today, Norman Chan. Hello. How are you doing, sir? Doing all right. We're all drinking iced coffees because it is really hot in San Francisco. Jeremy Williams, you're here. I am here. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome back. Thanks. It feels like it's been five to seven days. It's been exactly eight days because we recorded last week on Wednesday. Oh, this is this is the the rarest of rare. It's a Thursday afternoon podcast. People are waiting right now. Where's right. the podcast? That's hey. right. Where's the podcast? Hey guys, where's the podcast? Is uh, it still entitled this week? No, we missed still entitled this week because the schedules didn't work. We couldn't get uh, Mr. Savage in a time that would allow him to podcast because he's shooting Mythbusters right now. And it turns out our little podcast less important than <laughs> the giant Discovery Channel show Your Busters. listeners, they need their fix, man. You know what? We have I like, got text messages. I really? Yeah. Who texted you? Friends. Okay. Listeners. I, Where's the podcast? Really? What's your number? Just, I'm not telling you. Oh. It's 415 something. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you guys get into this week? Anything exciting? Do you have a fun this weekend? I uh, had I flashed um, uh, for the game frame relaunch. I flashed about a thousand micro SD cards. Whoa! That took me about two days, and so I caught up on some movie watching. I finally saw Jupiter Ascending. Oh, I want to hear what you thought about that. I, I thought it was atrocious, but visually, I mean, it was like it, it doesn't make up for it. It was visually great, you know. You um, realize it's the same story as The Matrix. Oh. It's not the same. Story. I can't. There's a red pill. The whole no, thing. No, I got that. Yeah. I got that. But it was just much more in your face. And the, you know, I kind of thought maybe they were thinking Mila Kunis is, um, who's Neo? What's a uh, what's his name? The actor's name? Keanu Reeves. Keanu, Keanu Reeves. It's like the, the female equivalent of the Keanu Reeves, right? She's pretty cool. Yeah. She, no, 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 no. But I, she's not. I don't think she even does as good a job at, at reciting the lines. It was. The, it she's was a, a fine actress. Yeah, also, I was. I was unimpressed. Uh, yeah, she's Black Swan. She's amazing. I never saw Black Swan. Oh, it's really good. All right. In any case, I saw that. I was disappointed. But then, immediately afterwards, I watched Looper. Oh, oh my Looper? God. Looper's really well, good. That's, you know, that's, and that's great because Ryan Johnson is directing episode eight and writing. Yeah. Yes. And that's part of what made me want to go back and finally watch this film. I was blown away. So you didn't, you didn't know going into oh. Looper what it was about? Nothing. Wow. I loved it. It's it is great. one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. It's like time up there. Movie. It's like up there with you know the echelon of like my favorite movies now. I think like mm -hmm. once you watch a movie and you're just like blown away. I was in tears at the end. And it's cerebral. Oh yeah, heavily cerebral. Hold on. Does that just mean you've never seen Brick? I you know because I I heard Brick was great. I watched the first forty five minutes and I was not taken with it. What about Brothers Bloom? But now having seen Looper, I'm definitely going back to watch yeah. it. You know, watch Brick Brothers Bloom. and go watch Brothers Bloom, which was his second movie. Yeah. Uh, it's a more of a, a you know, dramatic comedy, um, a, a playful farce uh, with Mark Ruffalo and Adrian Brody. 
and oh, Rachel man. Weiss. I should go. I, I've never watched that. I should go. I should go watch that. Beautifully written. B- uh, Brick is one of my favorite high school movies of all time. It's really amazing. Really? Did you yeah. see that before Looper? I saw that. Uh, yeah, it was like on net, like when Netflix streaming was really new. Yeah, that was one of the things that somebody was like, "Hey, you should check this out. It's on Netflix streaming." I well, four. I'm going back to it. Yeah, it's old. Um, what else, Norm? Anything exciting this weekend? Uh, got to ride a hot air balloon. Ooh, it was very nice. Did you, First time. Yes, it's one of those bucket list things. You always want to check it off. Do you uh, have a bucket list? I think everyone has a bucket list. I don't think I have a formal you, you have Google spreadsheet it? or anything. Okay. Like the Morgan Freeman, Jack Nicholson movie, The Bucket List. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, Hot Air Balloon, highly recommended. Even if you're scared of heights, which I'm not really, uh, it's you don't you don't feel it's it's not scary at all. Did, Did you, you go up tethered? Or no. were you what? just float, floating no. free? No. What, 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 what? A lot of times they'll tether you, they'll get, let you go up by yourself, you get to pull the cord. That's sad. Did you get no, to pull no, the no, burner? No, no, no. They no, didn't no. let you pull it? No. That's like snorkeling oh. instead of scuba diving. You only Snorkeling's go, awesome in the right place. No doubt, but it's, scuba is much better. Okay. Um, were you surprised by how loud the burner was? Uh, the, uh, they preface it by saying it's a sound of 10,000 lawnmowers. <laughs> it's not quite that loud, uh, so I don't think it, w- it wasn't like... A jolt, but it's binary. It's like either yeah, it's off, on, it's off yes. and serene, and yes. there's no sound at all, mm-hmm. or it's. Do they let you like bring hot dogs? You can put up on a stick and cook them in there, no, or anything? No, frowned upon. That's funny. Um, they say don't don't worry. There is a hole in the balloon. There's supposed to be a hole. Yeah. Okay. There are flaps. They have okay. a string that pulls that opens the hole more. Yep. Uh, for descent, um, and it was a great photographic opportunity. How was your landing? Uh, you were supposed to bend your knees. It wasn't rough, but. It definitely is a, you know, it's like landing a plane, but gentler. Were you, uh, was it a wicker basket? A wicker basket. So is it the largest wicker basket you've ever seen? Yes. And I've been to the Alameda State or County uh, Flea Market, which is, I believe, first Sunday of every month it's here a, in East Bay. It's a good flea massive, market. Massive, massive flea market. And I've seen hot air balloon wicker baskets you can buy. And what this was bigger? So to be, did hmm. you ask the hot air balloon pilot about his quali- or her qualifications? Like, no, do you, do, you do they have to go like hot air balloon pilot school? They do. Really? I, I, I yeah. believe they do. My, I know I one. Them. Yeah, they do. So what? What? Like, I mean, there's two controls, and then you kind of go where <laughs> the wind takes you. That's why you only go. I mean, it's all in the pre-flight planning. Yes. Okay. If and you have a a car that follows you. Yes. So and you only go for about a mile. That's it. Oh, there's n- you, you the, because the most control is up or down and you go up and you're taken by the wind just a little bit. You got to go early. So that's our, part of the pre-fight planning when the air is hotter above a layer of cool air on the bottom. Um, what about you can go around the world, can't you? You could, days, but right? I think those are different. Those are different types of balloons. OK, this really? is a passive just like go up and down. balloon. Mm. I, I think I mean, I think the idea of did anyone, has anyone actually gone around the world in a hot air balloon? I think people have gone around. They might have gone around in hydrogen balloons. Oh, but they're still they still can't steer. They still only go up or down. Yeah. Are you uh, sure? No, not at all. A hundred percent not. There is a story called famous around the world flights in a hot air balloon. First recorded around the world flight was oh uh, nineteen ninety nine. Wow, that's very recently. And I guess how long it took? That's when the Matrix came out. How long? How, how long did it take? Less than a month. Nineteen days, twenty-one hours, to go from France, Switzerland, somewhere to Africa. I think the scary part. That's it from Switzerland to oh, well, all the way oh, around. They the did the loop. They did a loop. Yeah, and it wasn't a solo flight. You got to go east. Well, yeah. Did they land? I guess they landed and slept and refueled and stuff. They that had is a very have. good question. No, they had to have because there's no way they could have had enough propane. I, yeah, or I think, whatever. I think they went around the world. I don't think they landed. You had, the only only one plane has gone around the world without landing, the hmm. Voyager. And you can't go twenty days. You could like strap, you could strap a lot of food on the outside of the of the basket. What would they do with the poop? And underneath it, it's a lot of poop. Oh come on now, they have no there's trace. some inventive people out there. I guess you could just dive bomb bomb people. Um, Interesting. I remember reading about this because they were concerned that they would have to go over the Horn of Africa where they were there was potential for like pirates and unsafe landings and I all that it, stuff. It was a race. Really? Have you played the have you either of you played the iOS game 80 Days? I know you liked it and I tried it and I was uh, just utterly bored by the game. You didn't get Oh, I, I find it utterly charming. Yeah. I think it's delightful. I should spend more time with it. Okay. Not unlike Brick. We should find out whether it was actually a, one continuous flight 
or yeah, that would be a like first paragraph kind of question you would think. Norm, you keep looking at this. I'm going to play some music, and then we're going to talk about Windows 10. <laughs> I heard that Jeremy Williams likes more interstitial music. It's something to break up the nonsense a little bit. It's, it's my cowbell. Uh, did you see that, that Microsoft announced that they have had 75 million Windows 10 upgrades in about a month, I guess. We're, we're right, a little bit past the one-month mark now. I don't know if that's a, bit, a high number or a low number. I think that's a high number. They're happy the with that? the fastest adoption rate. Uh, I mean, you'd whether hope so, or not though, they're happy free. is... We'll never know. That's the yeah. confines of their boardrooms. They could have, you know, because it's free, they could have projected much more. So who knows what their projections were, but they have announced that they are happy because it is the fastest adoption rate, faster than Windows 7, wow. of course, faster, well, of course, faster than Windows 8, but fa Windows 7, I believe, was the previous record because that was such a huge, that was, you know, that, that was the Because well, Vista sucked one. and XP was old. But, but it's free. I would be XP. curious to hear how it compared to at the Apple. Update. They didn't say. Which is usually either means that Apple hasn't said, yeah. or uh, Apple, I bet, has said adoption rate of uh, uh, of. What of do you think is the fast one? Probably uh, I bet Apple's. Mavericks. Well, no, there's more. There's way more Windows PCs. Uh, well, yeah, you'd have to f find out, you know, the per capita numbers. And and you know, you, these are not. They are literally, you know, apples in in Windows. Stop it. But. The thing that's an uh, interesting statistic about Windows 10 adoption rate is the number of configurations that they have installed Windows 10 computers on. I think I believe it was 90,000 different configurations. Oh, that's something Apple doesn't have to deal with. No, that's not at all. Good point. They have like eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit easier problem. Um, uh, so how, did Apple announce? They just say, give percentages. I, so they say yeah. things like... 37% of users are on Mavericks by the end of December 2013. I'm about ready to go Windows 10. Uh, the only reason I'm holding out is because of Oculus, and th I guess their support is coming. Uh, not in the next update, but soon. Oh. And I'm, I'm willing to just abandon Oculus until they're ready. And you know what? That's based on an net, internet analytics for Mac, uh, Mac OS computers, not direct information from Apple. I think well, usually Apple says this is the fastest adoption we've ever had, and they don't give numbers. The recall. goal for Windows is a billion devices running Windows 10. So they're a pretty, they got a pretty good way to go. Including computers, phones, tablets, and their IoT devices. Okay. So, okay, so like 95% computers, and then 5% tablets, Internet of Things, and yeah, they, they've got a long way to go. Um, but what this does mean... And this is unconfirmed on Microsoft's side. Is you know when's when's the Surface Four Pro coming? Presumably later this year, in time for back to school. Although I've been seeing the back to school ads. Guess what? It's back to school what? now. It's isn't back it? to school right now. The back to school ads are all about buying a Surface Three or a Surface Pro Three. Hmm. School has already started. Or a yoga. I saw a back to school ad for the yoga the other What's day. What's a yoga? It's the bendy laptop from Len Lenovo. Hmm. So if so I Christmas if, time then maybe. Uh, rumors say October. If I want to go Windows 10, is it safer to go USB stick, or should I just click the button? Click um, the button. That the, pops up. If the button doesn't pop up for you, it did. You, then you aren't going to be able to get an upgrade. It'll the upgrade will fail. The what? reason the reason you don't see that button, if your machine still hasn't gotten the hey, you can upgrade to Windows 10 now, it's, cause it's because they think that there's something in your hardware configuration or a driver someplace gotcha. that's going to cause a problem. Mm -hmm. I force updated both my machines with a USB stick. No, 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 by the command line. Oh, and it was fine. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I didn't want to wait, but it is better to have the USB USB stick ready. And if you have the button, back up and try the button. And here's the thing: you're going to want the USB stick anyway. Like you should, if you have, even for OS 10, one of the first things that I do is always make an install USB drive for OS 10 and Windows if I download it, so that if there's ever some problem with the drive that conks out and I lose the restoration partition, I'm not completely boned. Okay. Um, and not all backup stuff backs up the restoration partition, right? So okay. um, it's, a, it's a good idea. And like an 8 gig USB stick, which is what you need, is like $4 or something these days. So it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, I did a clean install. It was a big hassle. If you can do the upgrade, hmm. then that'll activate Windows 10 on your Windows 8 key or Windows 7 key, whatever you have. Um, and then once you've done that, you can wipe it and do a clean install, and it just activates automatically without you having to do anything. All right. There's also apparently a new version of Microsoft Snip. This is the utility built in the Windows that um, takes the place of you can use it instead of print screen. Of course, many keyboards don't even have print screen 
on some laptops. Are they going to call um, it Snippy? Nope, it's just Snip. Uh, I mean, right now, Windows 7, 8, and 10, you can hit Windows button, type Snip, and you get a little pop-up. And then you can drag and drop and, and across and save a, no kidding. a JPEG. Um, hmm. But uh, the new Snip will let, will let you, you know, uh, save, annotate, and copy and put it into your clipboard and, and do all sorts of... It'll be like combined with Paint, basically. Microsoft I've Paint functionality. I think this is much less still u- less useful than OS X's clipping tool, which is Command Shift three for full screen and Command Shift four for drag. It is incredibly useful for what we do. Uh, if you do Command Shift four, then you can just drag and it saves a, a little uh, marquee box. Shot. Yeah, marquee box uh-huh. that you can drag a uh, rectangle and that saves on your desktop as a PNG. Very cool. Um, that is one of the best features in Mac. OS yeah. 10 that's if, not in Windows. If you can remember the keystrokes. Oh, well, just command shift 4. Right. <laughs> I think I think that's the kind of thing that like normal people don't use as often as perhaps you do though Norm. I well, I always have to google it. I always have to say Mac OS 10 screenshot. There it is. And and there was a fundamental difference too because uh, on Windows you it's a it's an actual on-screen application. It's in uh, your you program see, menu. You see snip has a little yeah. pop up. You can click the the drag box. And so that may be easier to understand but just the convenience of Saving a full screen image for sure, and just having it save plop on as an uncompressed file rather than going desktop. to your clipboard and having to yep. paste it somewhere, and or save or it. even yep. pressing you know yep Control S afterward and typing in a file name. Uh, did you know there's an Apple event on uh, September 9th? Yes, this is uh, the invites went out. Hey Surprise, Siri, give us a one. hint. Here in San Francisco, it's always in San Francisco. Well. Oh, I guess not. I guess sometimes this one has been in... Sometimes they do it on their home campus. But for f- phones, it's usually in the big, bigger venue. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, so this is, this, when, does the, when does the mothership open? When does the, is that 2018 or 2016? Can't be 16. I mean, it's it coming right along. I mean, we're coming up. Like This one or the next one will probably be the last iPhone event that doesn't happen at their campus. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So this one's a, it's a Moscone or at uh, Yerba Buena? I no, believe- Bill Graham. Bill Graham, that's it. And that's wow, a big-ass that's, that's venue. In, that's, in, that's where it's different. Now I'm officially offended that we didn't get invited instead of just normally offended. Oh, because they had the space? Yeah, it's a huge venue. Well, Everybody Moscone's, should get to Moscone's go. massive also. But, but they usually do it at Yerba Buena, the little theater off to the side. For a phone? For a phone. That's where the that's where the, uh, the Mac, that's where the iPod launches oh. were in the old days, and that's where, I want to say that's where phone was last year too. I can't remember for sure. Um, I concur they should invite you. Let's so the the, the logo this time, blue field, uh, an apple silhouette, three colors making a rainbow that intersect to make six colors. One, two, three, four, f- five colors. Um, and it says, hey, Siri, give us a hint. Which, if you ask Siri, have you tried it? Check it out. It's unique. Hey, Siri, give us a hint. Oh, you can't say that. No, you have to say, give me a hint. Oh. Ready? Hey Siri, give me a hint. You'll have to wait until September 9th. I bet you are one of those kids who is not downstairs to open presents Ooh. early. Yeah. There you go. Do not like. There you go. Uh, so we're expecting phone, iPhone 6s. Yeah. Expecting. There are rumors. Probably not iPad, and expecting maybe some type of Apple TV slash set top box. I mean, I think that's the, what everybody's hoping for. As the one more thing. Um, so the rumor on the 6 and the 6 Plus, 6S six and 6S six Plus, oh it's terrible names, uh, is that there's going to be a camera upgrade. That'll probably be the big one. Uh, 12 megapixel camera, 4K video, uh, front camera increase as well. Unclear exactly what that's going to be. Although I think Apple Insider said that they're going to do the white flash on the LCD to give you a little bit of a flash on the on the selfie cam. Mm-hmm. Um I suppose that's a novel thing. Yeah, and they're going to have the animated wallpapers from the Apple Watch. That's the S feature. I don't know what the S feature is. Animated I, wallpapers. I, yeah, the motion wallpapers, like the huh. jelly, oh, the yeah. jellyfish, and the butterfly, and all that stuff. Um, I think. I mean, a cam. They've done camera upgrade before. Camera upgrade was part of was the 4S. This is the first time we've had a megapixel increase on the iPhone potentially since the 4S, though. So it's it's at eight now, right? It's at eight now, which I like. I'm quite happy with eight. I very rarely need to blow anything up larger than that. I 
the bigger ones, they just tend to take up more space. And one thing I really do like about iPhone versus Android is that I'm not just filling up my hard drive with these massive JPEGs. That is that is true. That is You nice. can always subscribe to Apple's iCloud. I do. I had to upgrade that space because I'm already over the limit. It, it is. Do they give you an option to save as a smaller image? Not on... You can you can save smaller images on the device. What but the ones mean? that go to the cloud, so it saves the full res on the on the cloud server, and you can when you bring the other versions down to the other devices, or you can delete the original from your phone and get a smaller res. But one there on is the no phone. option in There's the camera menu no. to say, you know, take this quality but save as an eight megapixel image. Hmm. You mean on for on a the phone? Well, we don't have twelve meg. It would. I mean, I'm it's saving or, or for you can't save as a four megapixel image. You can't res down. Are you excited about either? Are you excited about 4K video? Not really. I don't have any place to watch it. You, you can. Norm you, has a monitor. You like 4K. I've had 4K video on phones, and you know, obviously taking them with like the Phantom stuff. Even watching it on a 4K monitor, I it's like there's no reason to. Really? It's, I mean, it'd be nice because you can crop to 1080p. Hmm. But why would you crop? Well, if you because you, you have real digital zoom that actually is worth something now. I. Presumably, how do you? Do, what do you mean? You could do stabilization. Zoom? You can do digital stabilization. Yeah. Then they have that built in. Why need to save it as 4K? Just well, save, save a really nice stabilized because in camera post processing is going to be a higher quality. That's why. Then, then it'll real happen time. real time. Most, the, I think, the vast majority of the people who own iPhones are not going to import their 4K video and stabilize and output a. I'm just giving a use case. That is absolutely true. That's so true. Uh, but um, it, it it is it it. It seems weird that they would allow you to shoot 4K without a purpose for using the 4K. Just yeah. to say 4K. Well, iPad Pro 4K display. Mm. It's Maybe not going to so. be a 4K display. But I can't imagine watching 4K on a native device isn't impressive. I mean, I don't have a 4K monitor. But I would think if you had a shot with enough detail in the, the, problem like, is in the, the distance. The bit rates on this stuff is all are too low for 4K. Is that right? It's the same problem we had with 720p in the old days. The, the, the real-time encoders aren't fast enough to do a real bit rate. Yeah. So you end up with something like what, 60 megabits on the Phantom is what, what you said? 60 and that's megabits no, nowhere near fast enough for 4K. Let's do a, do a 2.7K. Do a 2560 by 1440. Oh. Plenty of people have those monitors. QHD. And, and, and that is the uh, resolution that gets scaled for the Apple um, the 5K monitor. The mm. 5K monitor is that resolution. Times two? Or times, times two. Or pixel doubled, and most of the Apple 27-inch monitors now are that resolution. So sh- why, don't, why not shoot for that? Well, we'll see. Uh, what they I think that makes for. a lot more sense in 4K. Uh, the interesting thing that I'm thinking about is if they have a higher resolution sensor, then they can presumably have more pixels to strobe, so you can do higher speed video potentially. Like if you could do 480, 480 frames a second, oh, instead yeah, of 240. Uh, uh, absolutely. That's really interesting. Absolutely, having a, a more more pixels in the sensor, you can do that. But the the ca- the camera sensors will always be able to shoot high resolution. Flat images than moving. Oh images. yeah, of course, of course. I'm just I I mean, if you look at the features I use on the that have been added to the iPhone in the last four years, the high speed is something that I use all the time because it's really cool to take something that you can't see and then like use it to illustrate something to your kid or to take pictures of kids splashing through rain puddles. Or Absolutely, and make that high speed look better in, in low light. Yeah, the d- oh, difference between be the quality of indoor high speed and outdoor high speed, it's is like grainy CRT versus HD. Well, high, high speed right now is basically indoor, outdoor only, unless you have yeah. really bright lights. Even the video is, there's much less uh, out, uh, low light capability than the photos, yeah. regular video. Um, what's going on with the Galaxy Note 5 pens, Norm? Uh, so Galaxy Note 5 was announced along with the Galaxy 6 Plus Edge, I believe, uh, a couple <laughs> weeks back, and the yeah. review units are out, and I think Ars Technica uh, broke the story. Uh, you can break, actually damage the phone by simply inserting the pen the other way in like like eraser end first eraser end first oops and it fits that way it fits per- just fine mm. um dimensionally in there but once you get all the way in it will become stuck and even when you are able to pry it out uh you may have then damaged the phone uh the, the phone's ability to detect whether the pen is in it or not oh man uh um, that seems bad and apparently in the uh, Samsung has provided a response saying that they knew of this problem. It, it was known in Galaxy uh, or the Note 4. And it's in the instruction manual. Read the instructions. <laughs> the instructions clearly say do not put the pen in this way. 
So this has the self-ejecting pen, right? You press the you you press it and it pops out instead of having to slide it. That's correct. Um, this is an unfortunate error. Yes, the spring mechanism is what gets caught when you put it in the other way. Um, it's an unfortunate error, but it's bringing up a ton of hubbub because uh, a lot of Apple pundits are jumping in, laughing at Samsung, calling this out as just bad design. And then uh, people who are anti-Apple or maybe Samsung people who like to defend Samsung are saying this is just like antenna gate, you know, and with antenna gate, the way you were holding the phone on the picture ruin your signal. And here, you know, no one is putting, no one is telling you to put your, your pen in the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> either way, it's bad design. No so, matter, no matter who says it. So, yes. okay. The most interesting thing that came out of this whole thing is I think Rene Ritchie said, you know, when everybody said that Steve Jobs says said you're don't you're holding it the wrong way. Yeah, he didn't actually. Nobody could find a quote of him actually saying you're holding it the wrong way. What he said was, "Don't hold it that way, if that causes the problem," which is kind of akin to saying, "Oh, my my hand hurts if I press on it here." Well, you shouldn't press on it there. This is the same thing. The, I mean, the only thing. This this is an example of good design versus bad design. The antenna thing was obviously a flaw with the design of the first of the first. Uh, of the iPhone 4. This is a situation where, yes, it works perfectly well if you use it as intended, but part of design is to make things not work in a way that will damage them if people are careless or are, or, or ill-informed. So it should, it's just as easy as, as keying the fucking stylus so it won't go in upside down, and then that solves your entire problem rather than saying, hey, don't put the stylus in upside down. I think Samsung's gonna have problems with this down the road if they don't, if they don't fix this. Um, and I mean, you've used the Note Four way more than I have. If it doesn't detect the stylus coming out, does the stylus stuff not work? Or no, does it, stuff, stylus. It just doesn't give you that pop-up yes, menu. Okay. Exactly. You just don't get your shortcuts. Uh, what's going? On? YouTube gaming is it officially launched now? I've I've seen people streaming games on YouTube for a long time, and they know that they rolled out sixty frames a second stuff a few weeks ago. Yeah, well, they helped, they covered E three. I don't know if you remember that, but um, th there was wonderful coverage for a full day hosted by Jeff Keeley, all on YouTube gaming. It was like their big promotional launch thing. I don't know what launched a couple days ago, but they officially launched it. What launched is their hub, a dedicated site and a dedicated app, but it, and it's used obviously to compete with Twitch which uh, I think the most majority of people streaming games stream with Twitch, and it's the one that's built into most of your, your services. Uh, YouTube gaming functionally takes just a lot of stuff that's already in YouTube live streaming like we're doing right now and puts it in a hub so you can organize from your channels and subscribe to a you know specific stream and watch it. I mean, you can go there right now. I believe the website is gaming.youtube.com and it looks a lot like Twitch. Their video quality seems to be a lot better than what I normally see on Twitch, uh, which makes sense because ironically, YouTube's live streaming is much more demanding about the bit rates that you use than the, like typical YouTube display videos are. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, YouTube has a well-deserved well reputation for taking a really nice looking video and then bit rating it down until it looks like garbage. And the streaming stuff that they're doing with the gaming side is looks looks really nice and it's 60 frames a second. Which Could is you nice. do 60 beforehand? You've been able to do 60, uh, on live streams for a little while now, maybe, maybe I, I mean, I noticed it probably five months ago. Okay. Uh, we don't do it because you actually double, if you want to do 60 frames a second, you really should double the bit rate. And we're yeah. bit rate limited out of this office. We only have a, like a 10 megabit upstream connection. Um, but if you have good upstream and you can do 60 frames a second, it looks really, really nice. Live video is something that is, is on this, it's gonna, it's gonna ramp up significantly. Just like just uploading video is now commonplace on so many hundreds of services. Right. I mean, Facebook, is, I mean, even big mainstream services that aren't about video are now also about video. About video, and now those sites are about video are about streaming. And, you know, Twitch was born out of Justin TV. And before that, I mean, the big players were Twitch and Ustream. Uh, but with YouTube getting in on it now, and I got to imagine Facebook is going to get on this some sometime. Uh, better DVR functionality, more better reliability, making it easier for people to stream anything, um, not just things from your camera, but for any type of input. And then along with that, YouTube has content ID, so regulating what gets put yeah. up on there and making sure people are, aren't just broadcasting. I think Periscope was the big example of people broadcasting anything 
um, and like streams of the Super Bowl. Yep, and and boxing matches and pay per view things, concerts and things. And that's gonna all need to get figured out, just like uploading video was figured need to get well, figured well, out. Another thing that YouTube Gaming gives you is it's a, a permanent home and an archive for the stream, whereas I think Twitch only archives it for a, a week. Well, Twitch has traditionally had a an upload to YouTube button on the but archive that's, streams. That's different though. Right. So this is a one permanent home, and I'm sure yeah. Twitch has managed to save a lot of money by not hosting those videos and supporting those streams on ongoing fashion. Well, I think the thing that Twitch said when they got rid of the old archives was that really the number of people who went back into the ma vast majority of upload uh, archives was very, very low. So why not keep them? Storage problems? I mean, why store something people aren't using, right? Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. Um, the 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 thing that is interesting about YouTube versus Twitch is that YouTube is much more aggressive, like Norm said, with content ID about copyright uh, infractions. And it's not like a, a situation where you have a DMCA takedown request and then have to go through a whole process. If they match you with something that they think somebody else owns, even if that other company doesn't own it, it's on you to prove that, that, that you don't, right. that you're not infringing someone's rights. Um, all the way down. And, and when you're streaming games, especially, it's important because everything from dialogue to music compositions and, and all that stuff is uploaded to Content ID. So when somebody claims, if, for example, Konami, if you're streaming Metal Gear and Konami claims the music that's in Metal Gear that they own, then that means you're not going to make any revenue on that video and Konami is going to make all the revenue on the video. And even if it turns out that Konami was wrong to claim that, and even if it's fair use, it doesn't matter. In YouTube's eyes, Konami owns the, the revenue. There's no way you can get that back. So, you know, it's a, in a lot of ways, there's a really huge audience for watching game videos on YouTube. But for creators, it's, you know, there's a lot of questions that, that I would be thinking about before I launched a gaming channel on YouTube. Um, NVIDIA share? Yeah, along with the uh, NVIDIA announced the GTX 950 line, entry-level video card, I believe $160, wow. um, using uh, Maxwell, so low wattage usage, you can overclock it. This card, I think, entry-level more for a kind of overseas market or just building a first computer, maybe for like... Or like a living room PC, maybe? Living room PC, uh, so, you know, so you can get it in kind of small form factor, um, but they are selling it toward the MOBA players, people who just want to build a $500 computer for, for MOBA gaming. Okay. Um, and they pitch low latency as one of the big features of this video card, which you don't think of latency as something that's a problem with, with video. The time it takes for you to click a mouse and get a response on the screen, but apparently for mobile players, even the highest end graphics cards have too much actual latency does even that, at the frame rate. Does this tie into their um, monitor V-Sync thing? No, not at all. All it does is in the workflow, the pipeline for the the, uh, the card, you can actually disable the number of frames it's running ahead of time. Mm. So at a minor hit to frame rate, you get a lower latency. So, so it's a driver thing. It's a, it's a driver thing. Okay. Um, but in its GeForce experience, NVIDIA also is now, uh, early next month, will be unveiling Share which is an ability to use more of its H.264 encoding abilities of mm -hmm. its video cards. So right now, the Maxwell cards and the, also the previous generations have the ability to just record video. So as you're playing a game, you can DVR your video. It's part save of it the locally. GeForce experience. You can sa save it locally, um, you have a huge file, um, set bit rate, set resolution, that kind of stuff on very minimal impact on your gameplay because it's not using your CPU to encode that. It's not using like a Fraps encoding. It's all built into the video card. Uh, now, the overlay, um, in-game overlay, kind of like a Steam overlay, lets you either save video or you can stream to Twitch. That's been in there for a long time. Or you can share a URL to someone else. So if I am playing a game and want to share the feed not to Twitch, but directly to you. Peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer. Wow. That I can send you a link oh. over IM. You can click the link, and with a Chrome extension, you can watch me play the game. Straight off your box. Straight off my internet connection. Hmm. So you'll have lower latency. So it's, Twitch has a multi-second delay right now because mm -hmm. it's, it's going through their servers and broadcasting to X number of people. There's only one Probably person. getting recompressed. And, and probably getting recompressed. This is getting basically just your video out. Yeah. Uh, but it is 7.20.30. Uh, with probably a low bit rate, they wouldn't say exactly whether it was 5 megabits or 10 megabits or what. It would scale based on your connection. Um, but then, also, there's the ability then, because you're running it in a, in a browser, basically, and you can run full screen, you don't need to have, you don't, you're not rendering anything, but your inputs will impact my game. What? So I can play a two-player single screen game with anyone by sending you a link. Oh, that's what? interesting. 
So he's going to have a little bit of latency so, on the tune of like yep. a quarter of a second or something like that. Yeah. We could play Trine or something like That's that. That's the demo they showed, Trine 3. <laughs> there you go. We could play Trine running, rendering on my computer but on screen, huh. and it would just take your gamepad or your keyboard input. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, the number of games that are going to work well with that is pretty low, though, because most of those couch games are really, really timing dependent. Like, oh yeah, like sure. like um, like your your uh, samurai guns or your tower falls and, and those kinds of games. Think of a adventure game. Well, if I'm playing an adventure game and you're just watching playing an adventure game, and I, I can't solve this puzzle. And even if it's a single player game, we say, oh Jeremy, can you you you, know, you want to take a stab at it? And, well, sure. And then you can move the mou- mouse and move the keyboard. Yeah. And they can control and hmm. solve a puzzle and collaboratively play a game. Yeah, which I think is a, a great feature. I'd like to try it. I, th- I mean, the other thing that that's going to be useful for is people who are broadcasting games, because what that means is you'll be able to blast your stream out to somebody else, have them run commentary or overlays or something on top of it for a game and like then, Dota or League and of then Legends, stream that and then have them stream it so it's not hitting your internet connection. I mean, I guess it's hitting your internet connection the same amount, but. Or but we, you or, can do overlays and stuff yeah. like that, so it's like more like a actual broadcast. Uh-huh. Run a run a contest. If you're a Twitch broadcaster, you can like broadcast a Twitch and say, you know what, I'm gonna pick a random member of the audience to play with me on this game, mm-hmm. and then send them a PM or something, and then uh, play collaboratively. Could um, you could you um, broadcast to Google Hangouts? Because I think it would be cool to get a team and everybody broadcasts into a Google Hangout and then somebody's the director and can switch between the different viewpoints. Well, you could do that just with OBS. So you have four windows with four different links on it. And then OBS. So OBS does a lot of this stuff. OBS even does like the, the, the hardware accelerated encodes um, on NVIDIA cards at least. So you could have four different capture windows, one that's each one and switch back and forth between like... Remote players? Yeah, so if you have four players, hmm. that, assuming you can do multiple streams, then you'll be able to pick in and jump in and out of each player's stream. Hmm. So, you, so again, it's basically like having a production set up with a bunch of the stuff that we have here piped piped over the internet, though, instead of doing it locally over SDI or whatever we do here. Yeah. The really interesting thing about all this stuff, and 60 frames a second, which is important for faster Twitch games especially, games that are 30, 60 frames a second native, is that the consumer side of this stuff is way ahead of the professional side. So like if you have an existing studio and you want to upgrade it to run 60 frames a second instead of 30 frames a second, like that'll cost you an absolute fortune because that stuff's really expensive. If you want to capture 60 frames a second off of your PS4 or Xbox One, all you need is a, uh, a, a Elgato game capture yeah. box. The 100, 200 bucks. Yeah, 200 bucks. Um, it's really cool. It's a inter- really interesting market because of all that stuff. Uh, um, and then... Um it works only with full screen, so that's one limitation because obviously you don't want to be share. I don't want to share a URL and then minimize the desktop, and yeah. then your keyboard mouse gets to go around my desktop. But it's anything that uses the DirectX renderer, it's right? Anything that uses full screen. So even if yeah. you're in the Steam, if you theoretically run a Steam overlay and open a Chrome browser or whatever the Steam Does that browser mean you could do is, like Plex videos, you could. I could share watch Netflix with you yeah. or something. Like there are ways to hot to, piracy to work around it and do cool things. Get that $8. <laughs> uh, you bad. guys use uh, Wi-Fi on flights? Yeah, you know, I was on a Virgin flight a couple weeks ago, flying back from Washington, D.C. I uh, was really excited because when I sat down, they had the new in-flight experience. Oh, what's that? What's now, that? Uh, it, what's it's, they've rewritten the software <laughs> for the seatbacks. They're like six-year-old, seven-year-old... Uh, I think it's older than that. Linux-based, slow-ass, the game sucks software. Super, super slow. Yeah. Um, now it's higher speed. And I thought that when you saw that, it was beta. They had to reboot it three times before the plane took off and ended up just doing the, the in-flight safety thing you know, like manually with the actual demo gear like they always used to, uh-huh. which I thought was a win for everyone How involved. How am I going to fall asleep if I can't hear the song? you got to put that... you got to get your headphones on and music playing before the song starts. That's the rule on Virgin. Um, but the new one is crazy fast. It's really snappy when it works. Uh, it goes to sleep after a while if you're not in a movie, and then you have to touch the screen to wake it back up. Hmm. Same terminal hardware. Same hardware, yeah. So it's just a bunch of... The way this works is there's a server that's then connected to however many seats there are in the airplane worth of dumb terminals. Um, there's new games. There's a Pac-Man, Pac-Man game, some other stuff on there. Do you still see a mouse cursor? You did not see a mouse cursor. Maps are new, though. It's hmm. not. They're not using Google Maps anymore. They're using uh, some other company I'd never heard of before. 
but it doesn't give you as good granular control over the ability to like zoom in and see where you are and what you're looking at, hmm. which I thought was a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. Um, the trick to those screens, and I watch people do this on every Virgin flight, is that they try to touch it like an iPhone, but it's not capacitive. It's resistive. You need to use a fingernail. So this was much faster. This was this worked grazing it like you do an iPhone. It's much more responsive. Well, then they had to change the screen technology. No, no, no. I think I think they're polling the screens more often. Perhaps, I think the problem before perhaps. is that they weren't they weren't. That would be interesting. Yeah, you could tell the frame rate was real low when you tried to drag yeah. the, the cursor around in the old screen. And, yeah, and yeah. like the move, the the move, the animations that move the menus in were like five frames of animation to to transition between them. Yeah. Now it moves super fluidly and it was really <laughs> nice. I can buy a drink for a co passenger mm-hmm. at twice as fast <laughs> before your hour and a half flight is over. Are there new games? Uh, there are a handful of new games. I didn't get to play them because I was on baby detail that flight. Mm. Um, but they, I saw Pac-Man. Uh, I was able to buy drinks really fast and get the menu placement stuff going. You can browse through the menus much more quickly uh, to see like what movie you want to watch. Um, TV is still dish out of New York, it seems like. Uh, but my hunch is that they just pulled the rack out of the machine and replaced it with new hardware to, to update it. Yeah. So uh, there's a story today in the New York Times, um, their tech column, about the rising price of Wi-Fi on flights. Uh, GoGo is the biggest provider. Mm-hmm. I, think, I believe they provide for Virgin America and Southwest. And American and, and, and I think US Air too. And comparing prices from just one or two years ago, they have risen significantly. Hmm. Well, it used to be 12 bucks for all day, basically, when you were on the airplane. Now it's much more dynamic. Depends on the flight, the length of time, the yeah. type of device you're using. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and also, they also project how many people on the, this particular flight were actually going to use and then scale on that. They also, I'm okay they, with that. They also scale the price based on how, how deep into the flight you are. Yes. So oh. if you're halfway through, the price is maybe half. That or, seems fair. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, the thing, the, the, the hack around all of this is that you can still buy a one-day pass on GoGo for $16. You can buy a one-day pass ahead of time yeah. and then use that as a voucher for, right. for a month and just input a code. That's the best way to do it. That's that, the way I always that's, do it. You, I found you could do that on your phone, you know, at the gate before you got on the yeah. plane. Yes. Um, uh, now that doesn't. Now if you just need f- uh, internet for the last hour of the flight, you don't get the discounted price that way. So you kind of look at it and see where your pricing. Always look and see where your pricing is. Plan your plan your flight yeah. napping. Uh, but I think the point is that GoGo, much like a service like Uber, undervalued its and aggressively priced its service to get people on board. And once now people we. It's something we take for granted and expect. Then they can jack up the price to what it's really well, worth or what it really costs. It's it's one of those things that like if I'm traveling for personal on personal time and I don't like I'm going someplace for vacation or something, I never pay for it. If I'm traveling for work and I have work to do and I need the internet to do it, I think absolutely nothing of spending sixteen dollars to to be able to be connected and do the work that needs to happen that day. Would you pay a subscription rate? I mean, I think um, we're I have to a point before where. It's it's not going to be unnatural to th- and, and and normal to feel like you're just going to pay annual rate or monthly rate based on how much travel you do. In 2013, when we when we had like the August September October time where we were gone like every other weekend, I paid forty dollars a month for unlimited go go. It was totally worth it because I was on three flights a month, four flights a month, and and I had internet. Now the one thing that I've noticed lately is that they're throttling based on usage on the on the flights, which is a good, which is another good enhancement, I think. So what that means is when you connect to GoGo, I always see people say, "Oh, my phone was fine, but my computer was really slow." What that means is you had like Dropbox on or something in the background syncing. Before you connect, turn everything off that's going to possibly download stuff. Your photo sync stuff, your Dropbox, your OneDrive, your um, anything that's going to get big files. Because if you if the first thing your laptop does when it gets online is hammer the connection, you're going to get boned for the entire rest of the flight. I mean, do does Windows and OS X, either of those have not necessarily airplane modes, but what's essentially a low bandwidth mode where APIs or Dropbox background APIs get turned off? So it's up to the apps to support that stuff. Windows 10 has metered connections. You can set a specific Wi-Fi access point as metered in the in the uh, Wi-Fi settings. And what that means is it doesn't do things like sync OneDrive. I don't know if Dropbox and the other third parties support that stuff. So just you know, just turn off your Dropbox, turn off your, this is your I photos think be, and all that stuff. As, as we're moving, everything's wireless and Wi-Fi 
cellular connecting to a hotspot versus connecting to airplane hotspot or cellular hotspot or just a, a, a Comcast connection isn't differentiated by your router mm-hmm. or by your wireless card, that's something that the OS should take into account or yeah. give you a toggle. I think this is a short-term problem at the same time. I think within a couple of years, we're probably just going to have yeah. Wi-Fi included in the airfare. But this, that doesn't change the physics of how much bandwidth you're... Well, well, but, but right now, but the bandwidth is going to get wider. Yeah, right yeah. now they're on first gen LTE yeah. or satellite connections, depending on which provider you're on, whether you're international or and flying across oceans. I think Virgin recently announced a, a w- upgrade across their fleet. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's done with um, from ground ground signals. It's well, it's so currently done with ground domestic signals. is done with ground signals. International over oceans is done with satellite. And so I, you can fly yeah. to Abu Dhabi right now and have internet connection the whole way there if you want. I believe Virgin is moving even domestic to satellite. Yeah. Well, and, and when we see things like the, if Elon Musk gets his way and launches the the constellation of low orbiting, even lower orbiting micro satellites that will provide internet service, then it'll presumably get cheaper and faster. Exactly. You know, we've had Wi-Fi in hotels for <laughs> over a years. decade, and it's not getting any better. Um, well, d- it, it's free now, at least in most hotels. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> no. no, the more expensive the hotel, the more, the more it costs. Ex- yes. No. Well, yeah. I mean, not in my experience. <laughs> you must stay in Motel 6s, man. They always have free internet and free HBO. I've stayed in nice hotels and medium range hotels, and they all seem to have free Wi-Fi to me. I'm just getting lucky, I guess. The problem, Or you pre-buy the Wi-Fi. No. They or, have two tiers. There's the paid tier, and there's the free tier. Uh, oh, there's a, Hilton does that now. Almost all Hiltons do that. Starwoods, I guess. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that I found is that when we go to conventions where there's a lot of people that are going to be on their computer in their room, the hotels, the internet hotel and it's bad when I'm just traveling for vacation or whatever, the hotel and it's usually fine. Um, Cortana for Android is out in beta form. Have you tried this norm? It was invite only beta before and I haven't had a chance to install the new one yet. Well, never mind then. Comcast says they're going to get the whole network to <laughs> Doxis. No, uh, uh. I thought more music. Oh, I, I mean, I could, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Comcast says they're going to get the. Will you test out Cortana so we can talk about it next week? <laughs> sure. I'm interested to see if it integrates anywhere near as well as, say, you know, Google now does. Here's my guess. No, that's my guess as well. Um. Comcast says the whole network's going to get Doxis 3.1 within three years. Do you know what that means, Jeremy Williams? Uh, super fast cable. But what's the point one? That's, is, that, is that interesting? Point one is the, the – so Doxis 3 is what got us to basically 100 to 200 megabits, I think. Yeah. Um, Doxis 3.1 is an incremental upgrade that gets us to one gigabit potential oh. service on our cable modems. Well, hot damn. That's fiber technology. One gigabit per second. That sounds good. Tastes like the future. Sure does. Um, they're saying within uh, two to three years, I think they said by 2018, across the whole network. They'll be able to do that over coaxial cable? Coaxial cable. That's impressive. There's a lot of bandwidth on that on that big copper copper pipe. Well, and I'm guessing there's a lot of interesting new compression they're doing. Um, well, probably not for data, though. No? Probably just for video. Well, it's all data. I know, it? but the but the video, H.265 should yeah. let us bring video compression down so they can right, pack right, more right, channels right. at higher resolutions and high, yeah. higher bit rate equivalents I guess um, the uh, yeah up to 10 gigab- gigabits per second is what uh, Doxis 3.1 is supposedly capable of so I assume I don't know if Doxis 3.1 is a firmware upgrade on the hard on the on the other end and if we'll buy, need to buy new modems mm-hmm. but uh, you know I do pretty much anything for a one gigabit per second connection to my Heck house yeah man um, especially if there's any appreciable upstream. I'm sure it's still going to be shared with the other people on your node. Dovetailing with all this wonderful video streaming, isn't it? Yeah. Imagine how much video we could stream if we had one gigabit per second. All of the video. Yeah. It's just like, it'd be like Ed TV over here. We're wearing little cameras, walking around everybody to see what we see all the time. It's going to seriously disrupt all the professional video production. I know. Industry. We're coming for you, video production so. people. Yes, it will, dude. Editing is still a big pain in the ass. Oh, that's true. Um, Google now is being deprioritized by Sander Pichai at Google. The Google Sundar CEO, Pichai. Sundar Pichai. The Google new CEO now. of Google. Yes, and this is a report CIA. that hmm. he, no one's explicitly said he's deprioritizing it. You guys like it. The report is that employees, there was an exodus of employees working on Google a now. A lot of people have left Google now, not the team. The team that's working on Google now the company. that started Google now. So Google now started off as a 20% thing where they said, hey, what if we can bring the data that you're looking for before you even search for it? Um, they demoed it. They rolled it out, what, with Android, like Key Lime Pie or KitKat or 
Jelly Bean or one of those. It was a, it was a couple years ago now, three years ago probably. I think it was when we were in this office. Um, and so yeah, a lot of the people that started on that team are now on to other things. I wonder why. It seems like one of the things people talk favorably about on Android. I don't know how you can make money on it. There's well, so much data, personal assistant stuff. I mean, now they're already collecting all of our location data using that as the Trojan horse to get the location data. What else do they need? Hmm. Google now always seemed like the it was the, the good, good front end for the Google making Google search um, personalized on your mobile device and even on on your on your desktop. Um, whereas in Apple's case, you have Siri, and Siri is separate technically from the smart notifications that. When you pull down the shade and it has all your events on the notification right, bar. Right. Um, and on Microsoft, Cortana, it is unified, but Cortana takes on the model of Google Now. Before Google Now, there's always been Google Voice Search, where on some phones you can have a voice activated. Uh, but the idea of, and here comes, okay, Google, I apologize for people listening out there, this phone just activated. That search, that passive search, being tied into something that you actually would actively glance at is a powerful tool. And Google now, even though you're not feeding necessarily more data just by looking at the cards mm -hmm. and swapping away the cards, you're using the search more frequently because you're using it like Siri and you're using it like Cortana. And if Google now didn't exist, I would still use Google search, but I don't think I'd be as engaged with the phone I mean, as much. Google now is a feature that is so compelling. It is, it is a reason to switch to Android, I think. Yeah, and, and then use Google search more often. Right, right. Rather than Bing, which is what we use if we ask Siri stuff. This is the impression I've gotten from you guys, which makes the news surprising. So, I mean, the, but the thing that's good about Google Now, and it's possible that they're going to roll it more into the other some of the other products. The thing that's nice about Google Now is the kind of ambient, the the hey, I know when your next appointment is, and I know where you are, and I know what traffic is like between you and the next appointment. So here's how long you in advance you should leave in order to get there in time. Now that's a, really cool. And did you know that? iOS now does that. Yes, I know. It's not as good because it uses Apple Maps and their traffic data is yes, less, less good. But I didn't know. That I missed that announcement. That and was in iOS 8 even. I don't think so. Yeah. Seriously? If you use default calendar, yeah. I just got my first you should leave 10 minutes early notification. Oh. And it was surprising and impressive and I, made me think of Google now. That might have been iOS 9. But it, regardless, like the thing that I want out of that is for it to get even smarter. You know, If I'm driving around San Francisco, I need to know how long it takes to find a parking space in the neighborhood that I'm going to. That would be great. Which would be even more useful. Yeah. Uh, for such a data-driven company, Google must know how people are interacting with Google now currently. Of course. Um, and I don't think it... The optimist in me wants to say it's less that it's that service is being deprioritized as a concept as much as maybe it will be replaced with something that better. could be better that, or more useful. That's my assumption is it's going to be rolled into something that's even more present than than I mean, because the now app on iOS and and desktop is much less useful than now on Android just because it's on your on your lock screen on Android. Yeah, it's not integrated. Yeah, on iOS. Um. There was a uh, Nexus 6, 6 leak. What's that mean? The Nexus 6 is the next version of the Nexus no. phone from Google. But what leaked? Uh, the, it has a camera bump. I oh, like, that was like the iPhone? Like the iPhone. That's It's a hilarious. little bigger than that. Oh, man. Yeah. That was everyone's dig on the iPhone 6. Well, everything old is new. Windows 95 turned 20 this week. What were you guys doing in August of 1995? I was enjoying my senior year of college. Me too. Do you know what Dan Emmerich so, was doing? Getting married. Yeah, he got married on Dreamcast Day, didn't he? Twenty years ago. Yeah, was this was that was August nine? No, August nineteen. I don't remember what day it actually was. I was graduating elementary school. Are you? You don't graduate from elementary school. <laughs> you just go to middle school. It's not a graduation. They're yeah. moving from the fifth grade to the sixth you grade. Grad there's a whole graduation ceremony. Nope, that's bullshit. <laughs> why is it part of the problem? Please, the, please tell me because well, you why graduate. There's two, gra two maybe three graduations if you go to graduate school. I got a diploma. You graduate from high school. You graduate from college. Maybe you graduate from graduate school. You don't graduate from fucking kindergarten or fifth grade to sixth grade or any of that. Not. Why not? You're just going to a new school. You got promoted out of one school and you're into the school where you're gonna get beaten up more. My kids graduate wow. from every Said year. You know, but even like pre-K. It's, it's good. fucking. <laughs> this is the, the, all. This self-esteem is gonna come back to bite us in the ass. Yeah. Congratulations on your accomplishment. Now accomplishments mean nothing. Nothing! You know, this reminds me of the Windows 95 uh, launch event where they played uh, Start Me Up. 
by yeah. the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Stop me up. And they released that uh, as a free track, I believe. Is that right? To celebrate the, uh, to commemorate the 20th anniversary. Windows 95 was, was a good OS. It still has the best startup sound. The Brian Eno one. I don't remember it. Was that an OS you could install on uh, five floppy disk? A dozen Ye- floppy disks? It was a lot of floppy disks. That's cute. I got, I got it on CD-ROM. It was the first, it was the OS first I one. got on CD-ROM. Yes. Windows 3.1 was Windows 3.1 was like three or five floppy disks, and Windows 3.11, the workgroups edition with the network stack, mm-hmm. was a huge number of disks, like 15 or something. Wow. Um, Imagine if one of those went bad. Oh, my God. What a nightmare. Uh, do you don't remember the Brian Eno startup sound? <laughs> Listen to that sweet compression. When you think about... When you you want to hear it again, Norm? Sure. Now the Windows ninety eight startup sound not this good. Windows ninety five was thirteen floppy disks. Thirteen, wow. Here's the Windows ninety eight one. It's all that reverb. It's a little shorter. Doesn't have those ding ding yeah. ding. Um. You know, I love those stories about the famous sounds, you know, the THX sound and the creating of and, and all that stuff. The, the rumor or the the guess, I think, probably more than rumor, is that the Brian Eno sound is the most expensive sound mm. ever created. Wow. Apocryphal, possibly. Possibly apocryphal. Um, Do you know how much they spent on it? A lot of money. Oh, I see. I see. Because, <laughs> well, like, the THX sound was made by somebody who worked for Lucasfilm, so it was just that dude's salary. Yep. The uh, the most of those other sounds the 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 Intel inside chime yeah do you know that one do 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 yeah that one yeah. exactly um, that was uh, you know presumably not made by Brian Eno Norm I uh, a I lot of syrup sounds these days nobody does them anymore no one does like app sounds or anything what what's the tweet the whoop the chirp the ch- what is there a tr- is there actually a there's a chirping sound not on the browser but on your on official Twitter client yeah. Does Windows 8 or 10 make a startup sound? Mm-mm. Nothing. Not by default. You may be able to turn it on, but huh. I, I, don't, I haven't seen anything in a while. Remember, back then, though, with Windows 95... Like, sound at sound all. Sound was new. That was cool. Yeah. It was the happy face. It was the uh, smiley face on the Mac. Oh, yeah. yeah. Having sound. Having that startup Bomb. sound. The, the yeah. Apple sound was one of the other famous sounds. The, yeah. the Apple startup sound. Yeah. Um, That's been there. It still does it. The chime. Forever. Yeah. It's part of the bias now. Even Wally made that sound. Yeah. I um so in 1995 I was a sophomore in college maybe a junior and I went to software I ordered from online someplace I can't remember one of the early computer superstores a copy of Windows 95 so I didn't have to go wait in line and also because I thought I would need it because I had just gotten a real direct connection to the internet at my house instead of a shell account <laughs> um, the Winsock stack that somebody had bundled like a copy of Netscape one the Winsock stack yeah, yeah, and yeah. all that shit that you needed to get Windows 3.1 connected. So I went and I, I was like, okay, I need these. I want to get on the internet and I want to have this. I'm going to buy both of these things together because it seems like I need them. And then I got Windows 95 and it had all the shit that I needed just built in. The modem dialer, the Winsock stack, all that stuff. So I, This was at home, you said? This was at home. What, were you living at home going to college? No, I was living. I had an apartment. I had an off-campus oh, apartment. I see, I see, we I didn't. I moved off campus after my freshman year. I think maybe maybe midterm. I can't remember because the dorms sucked and they didn't have wired internet. And, and you no had plans a, to do that. You had a dedicated internet connection in '95 and an apartment in college. No, no, no. I had a dial-up connection. Oh, okay. All right. I, I just I had one phone line that yeah. was the dedicated internet connection. If you oh, didn't I get see. hold of me. Probably <laughs> you weren't going to have a good time. I gave my girlfriend a pay my who now my wife my pager number in oh. case she needed to. Did you get sell me. drugs? And why was, did you have a pager? Because I was online and she couldn't reach me. Uh, oh, why did I have a pager? Yeah. Because I was working for a company that needed to me have a pager. I was a Don't man. pick uh, up the phone. A manager. I can't pick up the phone. <laughs> I, I remember going home for summer breaks and my mom would pick up the phone and she'd hear the... <laughs> she'd, well, what the hell is this? The phone's <laughs> broken again. Sometimes if you're lucky and they close the phone... It's Soon, fast enough, your StarCraft connection would not break. Yeah, mm-hmm. or caller ID would knock you off too. Like, uh, oh, not yeah. caller ID, but a uh, call waiting. Call waiting. Yeah, yeah. you always had to turn yeah, off call waiting. Yeah. I- I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. My mom would get so pissed when I turn off call waiting. <laughs> um, then I got ISDN because the dial-up just didn't suit. I ne- I skipped ISDN. Tennessee Tennessee had cheap ISDN for some reason that was unclear. 
but you could get a sixty four a dual line ISDN connection for about what you paid for two analog phone lines. Okay, which was great. Yeah, meant you had one hundred twenty eight kilobits both directions, both ways. and I could connect through the school for ten dollars a quarter or something. It was very inexpensive. ADSL. ADSL did not happen where I was went to school for another ten years from that point probably. ISDN is a great future sound of London album. Really? Yes. Is this like chip tunes? No, no, no. It's like real stuff. It's like electronica, but like early kind of stuff. Interesting. Mid nineties stuff. The nice thing about ISDN was if you were on the double connection, which you had to pay more for, and somebody wanted to call you, it would just automatically drop you down to sixty four kilobits. You'd take the call, hang up, and it would automatically bump back up. So it was always on. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. it wasn't in addition to your phone line. No, no, no. So it was a digital line. Hmm. It was a digital subscriber line, similar to DSL, uh, that ran uh, just over POTS, POTS lines. They didn't have to run something special to your house. So they just basically took your, your wire at the circuit and plugged it into a different wall. Um, hmm. And then you could get, like, I even had, eventually, when I had a house, when I bought a house after college, I had a uh, router with uh, Ethernet ports and an ISDN in, so it would it was the modem and the and the router, and it just doled out IP addresses just like a modern router does now. Hmm. Yeah, it was a weird time. I wonder if I still have that. It, it's a completely useless device now. Uh, Norm, what do you say we uh, take a moment and take a uh, uh, have a message from our sponsors? Sure thing. Norman Chan. Hey, Wolf. There it goes. Uh, have you ever built a website on the cloud? I built a website, but not physically on the cloud. Do you need cloud services built for speed? Uh, I imagine I would if I had a website. Does your business application or compute workload, is it different from everyone else's? I would hope so. So you deserve cloud resources that meet your unique needs right now, Norman Chan. All right. Uh, did you know that SoftLayer, an IBM company, has workloads that need to scale up and down quickly so you can turn services on, turn them off. If you have workloads that require high performance, bare metal, not virtualized, servers connected directly to all your virtualized servers, only SoftLayer can do that. And they are the sponsor of this week's podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if you sign up for SoftLayer, you can get $500 off the cloud infrastructure. Ooh, that's interesting. So you can go to softlayer.com slash podcast with a capital P, uh, and you'll get $500 off your first uh, of, of infrastructure for free just by, again, going to softlayer.com slash podcast, capital P, that's important, uh, to try it out now. You can order bare metal servers, you can order virtualized servers, storage, networking, security services, and your choice of 24 data centers around the world. All of those servers and services are connected to SoftLayer's unique network of unique network of networks that separates public, private, and management traffic so that traffic to and from your cloud infrastructure travels more efficiently. Awesome. And thank them for sponsoring this show. Again, softlayer.com slash podcast with a capital P to get started with your $500 off server storage network and security on a cloud built for speed from Softlayer. Thanks, Softlayer. And we're back. Works with a lowercase p, too. Oh, really? It didn't work with a lowercase p a while ago. Does it work with a capital P? It does. Well, that's good. <laughs> Woo! That was exciting. <laughs> Um, let's see. Where are we? The McWhopper. You brought this story to my attention. I thought it was a Twitter joke. Well, why wouldn't you think it's a Twitter joke? But it's real. Who hates each other more? What two faceless corporate entities right. hate each other more than Ronald McDonald and the King from Burger King? Well, we'll Clown the King. We'll see, because McDonald's has yet to respond. No, they said, we'll <gasps> talk. Oh, Wait, they what? did? What? Yeah. This is great. Wait, wait, wait. Tell, tell me the story. Give me the full context. Okay. So Burger King... In uh, conjunction with a charity that I can't remember, to raise awareness for the charity that I can't remember, said, hey, McDonald's, we hate you. You hate us. We get it. Yeah. But for one day, I think Peace Day. One day. One day only. In one location In only. Atlanta, Georgia, halfway between McDonald's headquarters in wherever McDonald's headquarters are and Burger King's headquarters, which are probably someplace in Florida based on my knowledge of geography. <laughs> you will go. We will go. We will meet we will make a pop-up McKing or Burger Dulls, right. Burger Alds, mm. and we will make a burger that will only be accessible there that combines our charbroiled goodness and your shitty fried Argentine beef in one sandwich, which we will call the McWhopper. 
It's all the ingredients of both sandwiches. It's one of each patties. Wait, wait, uh, of the Big Mac? Yes. I assume big, it's a Big Mac. It's a Big Mac and a Whopper. And you get both patties. You get yep. one fried patty and one flame broiled patty. <laughs> yep. Special sauce, tomato, M- lettuce. McDonald's patties are fried? Thing. Yeah, of course. They just have a griddle. You know, they don't, that food never touches actual fire. Does Burger King actually touch fire? Touches fire. Have you right. seen those ads? The fire comes up and hits the burgers. <laughs> Flame broiled. Flame broiled. Norman Chan knows what's up. Wow. One day. And Burger King has pr- has produced all the designs for the boxes and the branding. It's a for half, the, for it's the half color, half red, half, yeah. half gold. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, no, it's like two-thirds Burger King size, it looks like that. one-third McDonald's size. Mick Whopper. I don't like that name. I, Big Mick Whopper. It's got to be Big the, Mac yeah, it's Whopper. Not, it's not even enough. There's too many characters on the Burger King that's side, right. not enough on the McDonald's yeah, side. Yeah, but Mick starts it, and that's important. Big Mick Whopper. It's in honor, appropriately, of Peace Day. So ah, I remembered. They are. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I said eventually. International Peace day. Marketing Day. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, I think this is going to be big. So, here's the thing they're pitching this about a month out. That is not enough time oh. for the number of lawyers that think, need to get involved in this. You think it's this fabricated. is a pure publicity stunt on Burger King's part, or well, they or they're they're they've and been the peace day people. They've been discussing it for six months behind closed doors, and they're coming out with oh, making it making no it way look like they're throwing would let the them lead down. this. If one. it's going to happen for one day only, yeah, yeah. and te- this is a sandwich that any anyone with a car and five dollars can make oh, on their own. Right I didn't now. think of that. Right, we, we could have we, we could be eating McWhoppers right now. We could have had that for lunch. All you have to do is you get a McWhopper, you get, you a, get Whopper, a Whopper, you get a Big Mac and a blender. Wow! Put them all in there and then fry the stuff that comes out. You're done. Norman, you're a genius. You you, you could review it right now before ahead of time. Here's and, will they have their best chef from each <laughs> restaurant? <laughs> hey, the McDonald's the McDonald's takes their uh, head sure, chef sack. very seriously. That guy that guy is a he's a world class chef. Working with world class well, ingredients. I don't think it's going to change the price of pickles around the world, though. In a world class food laboratory. Here's McDonald's official response. A- and to, oh. okay. well, hold on. Okay. People can go to McWhopper.com to find this, right? Isn't that where the, what the URL is? Uh, you, I'll just Google McWhopper. You yeah, it'll, you'll find it. McDonald's official response via Facebook post. Is there a McWhopper Twitter is, account? I'm an abomination. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like the Sigourney Weavers from Aliens 4. Um, the official Facebook post with the response says, and they linked to Burger King's page, Dear Burger King, inspiration for a good cause, ellipsis. Great idea. We love the intention, but think our two brands could do something even, oh, some, something bigger to make a difference. Wow. We commit to raise awareness worldwide. Perhaps you'll join us in a meaningful global effort. Fuck you, Peace Day is what that means. Every day, let's acknowledge that between us, there is simply a friendly business competition and certainly not the unequaled circumstances of the real pain and suffering of war. We'll be in touch. Steve, comma, McDonald's CB- CEO. P.S. A simple phone call will do next time. So there wow. you go. Those, those. It doesn't sound like they're going to go for it. These guys, these <laughs> idiots at Burger King. Hey, it's such a big deal. Dear amateurs. <laughs> dear burger chuds. Um, yeah, oh. so there you go. I don't think we're going to have... I think Peace Day is going to suffer this year, guys. Uh, There's got to be a YouTube video of somebody making a McWhopper. I mean, I'm sure. I, this is exciting to you me. Could go, you could go... If there's not... You have like an hour and a half yeah, to get out there and make that happen before this podcast that, is up. I, and they get to this thing, point. That could be a big video. Yeah, you could make like 4 or $5. <laughs> Maybe cover the cost of your Whopper and Big Mac. Um, which which patty on top? Uh, I think that the uh, the the you have to put the Big Mac on top because it's a smaller patty. Incorrect. The what? flame broiled on top, so the juices drip in. I understand, the Big but Mac. it'll 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 it's like a cantilevered building. It, the the if the foundation isn't solid, the roof will fall. Well, the Whopper patty is only one patty, and the Big Mac's two. Yeah. So you but you, you the sandwich? pyramids don't start with the point on the ground and then have a big base in the sky. You start with the fat burger on the bottom and then the little burger on top, like a hat. All right. It looks like flame broiled on the bottom. Yeah. So they were designed it. No input. Oh, they designed Sesame? It. No, they, they had multiple options. Did they? I think it was pretty turnkey for McDonald's. Burger King trying to make this easy. Yeah, easy. Hey, guys, we have a week. Let's make this happen. You know, for peace. Because we love peace at Burger King. I would King. be really disappointed if next week on the podcast we don't actually have three McWhoppers <laughs> to eat live on camera. I don't, I don't eat at McDonald's. Why? Come on, because, because you're not a Chudwell. This no, is for every this time important. I go to 
their un- unpleasant gastric side effects. Let me tell you this. At McDonald's, you can get their chicken wraps, and they're totally fine. Really? The chicken wraps are great. Interesting. I I, uh, I broke my 10-year McDonald's fast when we were at the Air and Space Museum. Yeah, that's what's there. Because I, we hadn't eaten that day, and we'd been walking around all day, and I was hungry. And that was it was either that or eat a whole shitload of astronaut ice cream at $6 a pouch. <laughs> so I had a Big Mac. It was it was kind of underwhelming. Yeah, it doesn't even do great burger, but there's no reason to... Like, to I don't like. I stopped eating hungry. it because it's nearest my house, and the mere act of not eating at McDonald's is enough to make me not eat fast food, because everything else is too far away, or it doesn't have a drive-through. Um, look, this this is we're making your involvement easy, McDonald's. This whole thing is super super smarmy. Is there a clear winner between the Whopper and the Big Mac? For I you prefer guys? McDon- uh, Burger King. A oh, Whopper. Yeah, Whopper. Yeah, me too. Because I, like I, I, I like the veggies. I think the fairer comparison is the hamburger to hamburger. Uh, well, like the, the quarter, base quarter hamburger. pounder to the Whopper, right? No, no, no. Because quarter pounder, you can get quarter pounder with lettuce and tomato, I've been informed now, which is a new thing. Which is, does it normally not have lettuce It's usually just cheese and an enormous piece of meat and mm-hmm. then some grilled onions. That's great. Grilled um, onions. No. Grilled onions are great. Mm-hmm. Just because okay. your special lady friend doesn't eat onions doesn't mean that onions are a bad thing. I don't like onions in my burger. Okay. The, the, I'm talking about the base hamburger, the original hamburger. The patty. Just the one the, that gets ever smaller. Is this ever smaller, really? It's the one that's like 99 cents. I don't know. As, a, as a, somebody with a young child, when we eat fast food, we usually just get the regular cheeseburgers all around. Yeah. Because it's a lot less mess. Um, and I, I am a fan of the Burger King base uh, base sandwich. Yeah, the, the, the McDonald's just hamburger is a meager, a meager sandwich. It's what they launched with. You know, in the, when my mom, my mom tells a story when she first started working, when she left, left home and got an apartment, she would walk by the McDonald's on her way home from walking home from work. And you could get what they called a three-course meal for 25 cents, I think, which was a hamburger, a fries, and a shake or a fountain drink. What? For a quarter. That doesn't make sense. Well, there you go. Now that costs like $6. $6. Um, what is this real life first person shooter chat roulette? Are people murdering right. each other on chat roulette? Dude, I wish we had covered this on Friday because I was blown away by this. My enthusiasm has somewhat waned. But how many penises did you see while looking at chat exactly, roulette? Exactly. Like the, the, this is the danger that this this video brought a lot of attention to chat roulette, and that's the danger. It's like some innocent yeah. people, young people, you know, good mean people. They're gonna go on chat roulette now and be yeah. a little shocked. But so what happened was this art group this video team I, I forget exactly where but somewhere in the europe they uh did this uh, elaborate production where they had a space marine with a gopro on his on his hat on his helmet attached to a wireless transmitter that would be get beamed within 50 feet to a zombie walking behind him with a like a wired receiver that got pumped back to home base where they would go into this editing bay where some guy could overlay video images onto the screen and, and apply sound effects and another guy was doing voiceover and they had this team of zombies all waiting to engage the player that logged in randomly to chat roulette and got presented with a screen that said press or type space to begin and then they did this with like five or six people were they streaming this out so you could see what happened well it was all produced later Okay. So it was individual chat roulette pl- uh, users who just randomly got – and people who don't know, chat roulette is like a random uh, hookup – not hookup because that, that has implications, but a uh, video chat service that hooks you up randomly with other people. And, you, and just to be clear, it's originally famous for going there and there being a lot of dicks. Well, it's really right. famous as a social like experiment literal where you could have – but in, in having a lot of literal dicks showing up was a – a unfortunate consequence of that right but the idea that you could just randomly do a, f- a video chat with someone right so also ben folds in, instead of genitalia they were presented with a first person video video game and it all, all of it looked very much like doom so the guy who's doing voiceover was like come on let's do this thing aren't you gonna hit space and start the game you know he would like encourage oh, wow, people okay. he would like give you feedback and then the, the people who were calling in they would start to say okay and then they like type space or whatever and that was very little typing the rest of it was voice control so they'd be, they'd be like uh pick up that gun he said okay and they'd be like look in that wow. look in that chest and he would open it up and there'd be like you know ammo ammo in there and they decorated their entire courtyard area garden area well the, interestingly the, the video team that did this their office is in an old abandoned church so they used the grounds, including you know the outdoor space and the all over so like a multiple floors. Um, 
they didn't use the cemetery as part of the set, but it, I think there was like an old mausoleum or something in the back. But it was very spooky. And then the you get, guy would get chased by, they would go indoors, it would be like a haunted house. They'd get chased by zombies. There were limited special effects, but it was all done with like overlay stuff in the video. It was incredibly well done. Incredibly hmm. well done. And uh, I would en- encourage you guys to check it out by Googling it. The uh, chat roulette, real time FPS. Cool. Yeah. Um, New North Dakota passed a law that, among other things, uh, requires uh, state and local police to get a warrant before using a drone to surveil someone, which is a good thing. The same law, apparently, also allows uh, local police forces to weaponize uh, UACs, UAVs, um, with non specifically with non lethal weapons. So. Uh, tasers, beanbag guns. You gotta be like pretty that. close to use a taser. I don't know. Yeah, like fifteen feet, right? Is the range on a taser? I think. I mean, it's pretty close for a drone. Y- yeah, and and okay, so two things. Quadcopter. The surveillance side of this, the getting a warrant before surveilling people with quadcopters, probably a good thing, right? The other side of it, though, seems bad for a whole multitude of reasons that anybody who's actually flown a drone would probably understand. Quadcopter, sorry. Um, mainly the big one being that you have very little situational awareness when you're looking at the world through even a wide angle camera mounted on the bottom of a, of a quad. You see a very thin vertical slice and a very thin, even a very thin horizontal slice of the world around you. So it'll be difficult to know what's going on, whether you should be using one of the so-called less than lethal weapons that are actually still fairly lethal. Um, I mean, 37, 39, 37 people have been killed by tasers this year by cops. Um, so I just wanted to put this out there because people had submitted it for podcast topics. I thought it was yeah. worth mentioning. Mm-hmm. Um, not a good idea, probably. Like, I, I, What's your payload on that right now? You have one or two shots maybe, and then you have to fly back to base. And it's, I mean, it's just a bad idea. The odds of being able to aim is not very high. Well, the odds of being able to hit someone, most yeah. of those less than lethal weapons are for 10 to 20 feet. So if you're that close to somebody with a quad, you're actually going to put them in fairly serious danger, especially if you're moving quickly, just because if they stop, you'll smash into them with the quad. There's no sneaking up on somebody either. No, no. It's a, it's a weird... I read that uh, California was trying to ban uh, quads over top of private property. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, do you own the space above your house? I don't think you do right I now. I don't think you do. Nope. No. No. Um, if they ban flights over pub- private property, it's going to mean that the only place you'll be able to fly is state and county parks mm-hmm. or property you own, presumably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which would be really bad. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, Instagram. Oh, boy. You know how Instagram is famous for two things, free filters and square photos? I yes. Do. Nope. No square filters photos anymore. Now it's just filters. Well, you can still do square true. filters, square photos. Not true. If you take a photo within the Instagram app, yeah, it will still be square. Oh, they only support square still in the app. Okay. Uh, if you use it as a camera. But many people take photos on their phone and then import in the Instagram app or take photos on any other camera they have, put on their phone, and import it and share. Mm-hmm. And I think that's totally fine. I, I think there are two ways to think about this. One, Instagram itself is it's massive. It's, people use it even though it's owned by Facebook a separate from Facebook because it's a dedicated photo sharing stream and there are some so, like some just social network benefits of that of being a really great photo like um, uh, a photo a visual version of a Twitter basically um, and if you think of it that way and, and artists have, have had great success sharing on Instagram then having non square images to share is a logical next step and the idea of but if you also think of the constraints from a photography standpoint of composition, having the square constraint actually was really useful. It, I mean, it, it helped develop this or popularize a, uh, a, a, a type of photography. Well, and, and also it makes the, the, the experience of scrolling down through your feed really pleasant because all the photos are the same aspect ratio. There's no kind of short photos, tall photos, whatever. That's right. and, and there's a cadence to your feed. Uh, that it's pleasing, um, that less chaotic. So mm-hmm. why did they make the change, Norm? Do you know? I think because Instagram sees itself as not just a, you know, uh, as a, a, f- a fun way to share and, and filter and, and add filters to your photos, uh, but as a, 
competitor and and it's bigger than you know bigger than Flickr. a lot of yeah. I don't know how compared to Flickr how big but bigger than many photo sharing sites and it is its own social network um, that's purely based on imagery. It's I mean it seems to me like that's something they have to do if they want to compete with the, the kind of more the other social photo sites, right? Now, Jeremy, you're doing an interesting thing right now, an experiment where Twitter, you can embed photos and multiple photos, but Twitter automatically does a resize where what they, you well, see in crop. your feed crop. is a, a crop, but if you expand, you see the full image. Yeah. And that's a, a great compromise if you want, um, and a lot of people have used that for interesting, um, interesting, like unexpected ways. For example, the the way the uh, Twitter feed will crop an image will hide some pic part of the image, like yeah. a, a poll or something. Mm -hmm. And then you can, when you expand it, you'll see real reveal more information to get you to engage with that. I was that wondering post. if uh, if if they'll do the same kind of thing and keep everything square in the feed. Hmm. But if you click it, they will expand it. But what about for uh, landscape pictures? Yeah, you have can to still make those. You can still crop in on them. Have to expand. But then how do you expand it? Then you just get smaller. Oh right. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I see both sides of this. I like the square photos is why I didn't use Instagram in the beginning. Um, yeah, and, me too. But I, I, I mean, I kind of felt that was a nice thing to have as their thing. So, I mean, what do I know? Um, well, I think the users will let Instagram know soon enough. That's true. I would imagine the users let them know that they wanted wider photos or more flexibility. I would imagine that's why they're doing it. Maybe not. So speaking of unexpected social network side effects uh yesterday there was another shooting uh that happened live on air in uh southwestern virginia uh and the videos of that ended up on twitter and facebook very quickly because those services default to autoplay video on a lot of people saw really profoundly graphic videos that they probably would have preferred to not see just because they popped up in their feed on their mobile devices and the videos started rolling when they came up to them um so as a public service uh don't uh, turn that stuff off. It's easy to do. You can go into settings on Twitter uh, and uh, you have to do it on the web version on both Twitter and Facebook, but go in there and turn off the autoplay on video. Uh, and then also yell at any of your friends that shared that shit because it's not, not cool. Did, did it pop up in your feed? No. No, uh, me neither. No. Um, there were, there were two videos. One was the, there were, well, there were a bunch of like TiVo type clips of the, of the live broadcast that happened on the local station. Yeah. Um, cause it happened like during, during a live segment on the morning news. Uh, and then there were, uh, the, the follow-up was the shooter actually sh filmed the shooting and posted that and people tweeted that and, and posted that. And Twitter was pretty fast about killing the second one, but I don't think they could chase down the other ones as easily. So, um, anyway, uh, Amazon. Uh, laid off a bunch of the Fire Phone team uh, from Lab 126. So Lab 126, as you may remember, is the hardware team down here in the Bay Area that designed the original Kindle and designed the the e-ink e Kindles and a lot of the hardware that Amazon has since built. Uh, so they laid off, uh, I think, several hundred people on the Fire Phone team hmm. uh, and also have are rumored to have uh, canceled several other projects, including a 14-inch tablet and a smart stylus and I think a Pico projector, according to the Wall Street Journal. You know, for all of Amazon's missteps with the Fire Phone, I still think they have probably the surprise product of the year. With the Echo? With the Echo. Yeah. I think it's really funny watching everybody come on uh, come on board with the Echo as they've started adding more and more functionality to it as, oh yeah, this is a device that's interesting. It's getting really good reviews now. Um, well, yeah. it has a new functionality so you can evaluate it back right. then. But, and back then it was also $99 and now it's $200. So and I think that's fair. A, a, it's a, like 180 right? Because so, it, so, yeah. it doesn't come with a remote. Right, so something like yeah. that. And then, uh, and then as well, uh, with new services, a lot of those functional that functionality is only useful if you have extra hardware like uh, new smart things. Right. So we talked about smart things integration coming last week. Uh, I've been testing it for the last week. It is fabulous. Hmm. Uh, you can say things like Siri, uh, sorry, Alexa, turn off all the lights in the living room. It'll turn off all the lights in the living room. You can tell it to Siri, it's bedtime. And that means it'll, or, or sorry, sorry, Siri, turn off all the lights in the house and it'll turn off all the lights you specify for that, for all, for that command, all the lights in the house. Um, I wish that it would let you change modes. 
for smart things. So smart things, you have different modes for the house based on whether people are present, whether it's daytime or nighttime. And you know, my house moves through basically four basic modes. Uh, the first one is is daytime when we don't need lights on in the house because it's bright outside. The next one is nighttime when we're awake, we want lights on. Uh, the night then bedtime is uh, after everybody's gone to bed and you want the lights to stay off. But maybe if the motion sensors pick something up, then turn them on in specific rooms. Uh, and then it comes back to, to daytime again in the morning. It's a perfect product for Amazon because, you know, they're doing things like their buy now button. Uh, and you, not, not everything about on the Amazon does goes back to their store. Yes, they want to collect a bunch everything of data. Everything that Amazon does comes back to their store, dude. It may take two or three steps to get it there. It will take a yeah. few steps to get there. But things like uh, what Echo also augments is Amazon Prime Music. It makes Prime Music and that library more valuable. Um, yep. And it's it's their foothold into the living room. Yeah. I'm, th I'm thinking about getting a second. I would love uh, for, them, for them to make uh, like a, a small puck version. Maybe something that, you know. Well, do you not just use the remote? So um, I use the remote I for different areas. Remote. And I but think you do have to press the button for exactly. that. Exactly, and you have to hold it. And I think one of the best things about it, and the thing they got right out of the box, is the uh, omnidirectional mic mm -hmm. and passive voice pickup. The the thing that I found that's amazing is I can be. It's in my living room. I can talk to it from the kitchen, from the hallway, basically every room but my bedroom or my office, and I can talk to it from there. Just because there's no kind of line of sight to it from from those two places. Um, but all the way, I mean, it's a small house, but across the rest of the house, it works just fine. And, and like it is universal appeal. My wife loves it. She loves that she can come in with a load of laundry and say, hey, turn on the lights in the bedroom and they'll just turn on. <laughs> um, it's you know, really, really good. When you think of something like Google's goal and their stated goal is they want to build a Star Trek computer. And earlier we talked about them possibly deprioritizing Google Now and what could be the follow up. Well, eventually they're going to build the Star Trek computer and whether, how Google Now's functionality ties into that um, is yet to be seen. But I, th I think this is as useful as the, like this is the closest thing we've seen to that yet. But the way we've seen the Star Trek computer portrayed in the original series and Next Generation and, and going forward, a lot like Next Generation, this omnipresent, uh, passive listening voice thing isn't exactly how we're seeing, there's a lot of, a lot of architectural and um, just like just physical limitations that we're not getting from that. For example, Echo being in your kitchen and you have to yell louder when you're in your living room and you mentally thinking of it as a physical object, you know, not just being part of the infrastructure of your right. house. Yeah. Uh, they're interesting and, and you both have kids and how your children engage with Siri and with Echo and whether they should have a corporeal form or whether it should be a panel on the wall or have no paneling and just be a hidden microphone. When does your Jibo ship? That's, I don't know. I mean, because that, that's the corporeal form, right? But, and that's, then that's one, maybe that's one logical end of it, but that's something that we didn't foresee from the next generation, that the value of having an actual physical presence and, w and how that physical presence affects its usability and the way we emotionally connect with it. Well, so if I could put one hub in either some places it's visible or some places it's hidden. I, I don't care either one. And then put endpoints into like wall gangs in my in next to my switches. Endpoints being microphones. Microphones, yeah. yeah. I would do that in every room in the house. Yeah, I've thought about that. Yeah. Well, there's nothing stopping you from hooking the output into speaker systems. And I mean the other way though. I want the I don't care about the speakers. But I would like to hear it from anywhere and be able to talk to it from anywhere. Yeah, the being able to talk to it from the anywhere. The problem is, is like <laughs> when it does talk and you hook it up to your amplifier system, there's no isolating that speech no. to a single room. You know, it's going all over the, the, yeah, the house. Yeah, and, and that's another another thing of it. Like, like, do you want, is there a future where the feedback comes only on your watch? Yeah, you can, it'll hear you from uh, omnipresent, you know, any direction and right. hidden, but you only get your feedback to you. Yeah. Well, or, but if you, if you have a watch, why do you need microphones everywhere? Because the watch should be the gateway, right? I, I think, again, uh, underestimating the value of not having to do anything but oh, talk. I mean, there's, there's a lot Even to be said about getting your, up in the middle of the night to go pee. And and wanting to turn on the light to check something and not having to and, and it's just like uh, motion sensors, mm -hmm. motion sensing lights. This is not magic. A, it's not a difficult tech problem to solve. No, either. they can if they know where which microphone triggered the you know the question, yeah. they can send the audio to that speaker set. Well, but anytime you go from something that's a one one endpoint to a network effect, things get a lot more complex. Look at for example Sonos versus Bluetooth speakers. 
right? Controlling the Sonos and controlling the building the UI to control multiple Sonos to endpoints and all that, or be able to sync them all together. All, all like that stuff. It does add a, a massive layer of complexity that doesn't exist today. And it's Echo. a user interface problem uh, that right now Apple does isn't actively tackling, or Google, like the, 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 the home, the home. I mean. Yeah, it's funny because this is all stuff that Bill Gates talked about in that Road Ahead book that came out with Windows 95 20 years ago. When he built his smart home. When he built his smart home, which I'm sure is laughably, it's probably been updated 20 times since then. Yeah. But but um, like you, you would hear stories about people who went to Gates's house and you put on an RFID chip or something. And when you walk in, each room knows your climate preferences and your lighting preferences. And it adjusts throughout the day as you as you move from room to room. Um, which didn't take into account everyone walking around with watches and phones that could do the exact same right. thing now. And so looking forward, what's in the next five years, whether, you know, design the infrastructure that's going to be for the use case. Well, I mean, I think that the, I think that the end, end result is that the device has become even less personalized and more generic so that when you pick up an iPad and you log in with your thumbprint, it says, oh, hey, this is Will Smith's iPad. You have your gigabit connection. It streams down all of your shit from the cloud server someplace, and, and it's just like it was on your hardware that's sitting in your bedroom when you pick somebody else's It's up. like the Chromebook pitch. Right, right, exactly. You can, you can smash a Chromebook and get a new one. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dish Network is having the biggest, I think people are calling it the biggest TV blackout in of all time. Uh, in 36 states, the dispute with the Sinclair Broadcast Group over money, as always, uh, means that Dish Network has lost all of the local affiliates, basically. So ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC, I believe. Um, which means that if you are using Dish and you don't have a terrestrial antenna, then you will not get uh, terrestrial uh, stations in those 36 states and I think the District of Columbia as well. Um, so, you know, that's bad for everyone involved. I think the FCC is getting involved because it's so widespread. And Dish and Sinclair have said that they're, working, they're going to come to an agreement. Um, that it is not an impasse, so that's good. Uh, Pixar in a box. Have you guys? I, I feel like we might have talked about this before, but maybe we didn't. Maybe we talked about it when they released some software to the open source world. You mentioned this at lunch. It sounds really cool. So Khan Academy and Pixar have worked together to do a project that they call Pixar in a Box. Uh, there's a series of videos that teach you about how Pixar makes movies. Uh, and what that means is everything from storyboards and concept creation all the way through the technical stuff and the sculpting, the sculpting maquettes so that the animators have reference, animating, uh, lighting, the technical direction stuff like, you know, the hair and Brave, the fur and Monsters, Inc., the shiny metal in cars, uh, and uh, all the way back through to rendering. Khan Academy is, is a wonderful resource for students of all ages where mm -hmm. they can go and they can watch videos and then they can interact to some degree especially with the programming and the mathematical sections where you can actually you know write code or type in math and see if the, it comes out right is there any interactive component to this new uh pixar in a box so i will be perfectly honest i i went and i watched the introduction video which i think is interesting to everyone because yeah. um, it basically says here's here's the start to finish how we make a movie at pixar in seven minutes um, I don't know if there's actual test and instru in instruction at the I, end. They do. I know they do just lecture series as well. And this is a great one, even if it's just that. But I would be amazed if it'd be really cool if you could engage in some very stripped down form of animation. I mean, the thing that I love about this is that when I was a kid, if you said, um, you know what, there, there are, look, it looks like there's tests because there's like parabolic math that shows you how to calculate, how to build grass. Hmm. Um, and pra their practice problems and the whole thing. So the thing that, like when I was a kid, if I said, if I saw, if I had seen Toy Story when I was six, eight years old and said, oh, I want to go work at Toy Story one, at Pixar one day and learn how to make 3D movies. Yeah. And I went to the school guidance counselor with that. Then they would have said, well, that's a really hard thing to break into. Why don't you think about like going to work at the local vacuum cleaner factory instead? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now you just go to the internet, you go to this page. <laughs> and if you, if you're interested in one thing, you can dig into that. If you're not, you can go. And, and kind of take the whole thing and find out which part you are interested in. And maybe you're not interested at all. And it's all, all that's okay. It's an incredible, it's an incredible resource, Khan Academy. Truly. Um, so that is at, um, well, just, just type Pixar in a box in. It's at khanacademy.org slash partner hyphen content slash Pixar. Um, and the introduction video labeled start here, super, super cool. They're pitching it as a thing that you can do with your students to get them excited about computer stuff. Um, if you're a teacher, I think. Google, okay, so this is a good story. 
speaking of crazy internet stuff, did you know that much like uh, video games and uh, movies such as The Last Starfighter, mm-hmm. Google is using your search queries to recruit programmers with specific skills? So if you are good at Googling, your Google Foo is good and you can use and manipulate its syntax. More if you ask specific, if you have specific queries that indicate you are a student of a particular language working on a specific type of problem. Uh, right. Okay. Then like a, they, a certain kind of equation, maybe. Exactly. So then they pass you, you do the query, you get your results, but then the page kind of folds down and says, hey, do you like doing this? We have, we have a puzzle for you. And it redirects you to a FUBAR a service, google.com slash FUBAR, I think, which is a series, which then presents you with a series of programming puzzles that you have. Uh, I think they give you a couple of weeks, but most of them will take an hour or two if you, if you really tackle them. Which, if you succeed, I bet you get a chance to interview in the first of six interviews <laughs> that you have to go through in order to get a job at Google. So if you succeed in the challenges, uh, then you are recruited by the Galactic Empire to fight the Codon <laughs> Armada. <laughs> Um, no, no. Uh, they uh, re- ask for your contact information Victory. after you compete six or eight of these challenges, uh-huh. uh, and then you get kind of it seems like hot hot linked directly into the recruiting process uh, a little further down the chain. So you don't have to go and do like t- t- typically when you interview for a programming job at Google, you have this massive battery of tests that they do to determine your aptitude and the way you approach problems and stuff like that. This you bypass all that stuff because you've already done that. Yeah. And then you just have to go to the, like, am I a good cultural fit part of the interview process, which is probably, like you said, still like 16 interviews or something like that. That's cool. But I thought that was interesting. They were they're famous for doing interesting um, gimmicks like this. Like, they used to, like, 10 years ago, they, or more maybe, they put um, problems, like just mysterious uh, problems up on billboards. Yeah. And it wasn't labeled Google. Like, no. you didn't know what that was. But it was an interesting question that only, you know, triggered uh, the curiosity of the type of people that they mm-hmm. wanted. And then you'd follow up and you'd go to a URL and you'd solve a problem and eventually get an interview. Yep. Uh, the FAA is, uh, wait, is this a real thing, Norm? Yes, it's a real thing. What is a F- FAA paper airplane license, Norm? The FAA yesterday granted the first license to for a, uh, a pilot to fly a paper airplane commercially <laughs> <laughs> under what? the Section 333 exemption. So is this the thing that has to do with quads? Yes. So a quadcopter advocate, Peter Sachs, who's also a lawyer, a helicopter pilot, to prove, to show the ridiculousness of the FAA's jurisdiction over commercially powered vehicle flights, um, applied for a commercial license to fly his powered paper airplane, and the FAA granted him the license. Wow. He still needs, but he cannot fly it himself because he is not current under the uh, to uh, his license to fly commercial uh, air, air vehicles. Um, he has to fly it during the day with a spotter, line of sight. Mm-hmm. Um, same as the quad rules. Same as, this, is this, this is the quad rules. So what happens if he doesn't do this now that he's gone on record gone as on a record? commercial paper exactly. airplane pilot? If he flies commercially, then he could have his license revoked. Oh, man. That sucks. Um, there's a Galaxy Quest TV show coming. This is exciting news. Any of the original cast members? There's absolutely no, no confirmations about anything except that uh, Entertainment Weekly says that Amazon has picked it up. Oh, for I Prime mean, streaming? For Prime huh. streaming. This okay. is exciting news. Do you know Rain Wilson was in Galaxy Quest? Yeah. Yes. He's like the science. Oh, he's one of the aliens. <laughs> well, he only has like two or three lines. He's one of the aliens. Yeah. Who, not the one who dies by Grapthar's hammer, you shall be avenged, but one of the ones who is a fan of... Uh, Mm-hmm. of the character yeah it's funny watching that because there's a lot of extra people who are like background characters secondary character characters who ended up doing bigger things yeah um fassbender's in assassin's creed is he the in first, the video game or the tv show or the movie the first photo of michael fassbender as a new assassin's creed character appeared today production on the film assassin's creed begins wow. uh, i believe this month I, I mean, are we excited and about this next year the photo looks good costume looks good what I, era it looks, you know, it's like an Ezio, not Renaissance. It looks maybe earlier than that. Like Middle Eastern, Creed, yeah. Middle, but I'm not sure. Okay, not. Uh, I think they have a cast announced, um, and it's in production. I'm sure people will be excited, and to and we'll yet to be see. The Hitman movie came out. Yeah, how how a video game movie performs. 
It didn't do that well. Well, Warcraft is coming out soon too, right? No. That's next year. Is that next year already? They've shot. They finished filming it. I we didn't saw know costumes that. at, at Comic Con. That would be great. I think they finished filming it. Maybe they didn't. They have. Um, Duncan Duncan Jones is doing that, right? Yep. Uh, of Moon fame, uh, and also David Bowie's son, if that matters. Uh, I saw a rumor. I think I think it was a rumor. It's an actual report that Disney has booked. Every large format screen in the country for a full month. That is true. For is true. Force Awakens this winter. I don't know if it's winter. every large format, but at least every IMAX. Every IMAX. Screen. Oh, every IMAX. Every okay. IMAX screen for one full month. Um, episode 7. That's really Force optimistic. Awakens, it's will, not unprecedented, though. They did it with the Hobbit series, mm-hmm. but they haven't done it since. Oh. Uh, 10,000 screens at launch. Every country, or not every country, but uh, a Sorry, giant. Sorry, Uzbekistan. A giant international premiere as well, except China, who was a blackout period for December. Um, Why does China have a blackout period for December? Because they want to promote uh, domestic their own domestic films. As well. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, it could make a metric ass ton of money. How much is a me- like a metric ass ton? Is like two billion dollars? No, they're saying opening weekend could make six hundred million dollars well, internationally. Remember, at the start of this year, I was looking at the release calendar and I said, "Look, there could be three biggest grossing movies of all time this year because fast seven was a contender when you say biggest of all time are you going to top 10 top 15 I'm talking top five like, like top, top five three. top three because avengers 2 is coming out you look at avengers 2 that 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 there's precedent for that to do well it didn't do that well but it did okay um you had fast seven which is a juggernaut at the box office and then you have force awakens now i think the irony is that we ended up with three we're going to end up assuming force awakens performs at all we're going to end up with three movies that did exceptionally well this year, but it's going to end up being Avengers, uh, uh, Jurassic World. Jurassic World on top. Jurassic World on top, and then presumably Force Awakens. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 I think it's going to end up Force Awakens, Jurassic World. Yes. No, 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 agreed. Yeah, I think Force Awakens is unstoppable. It's going to de- Unless it's just terrible. It's going to establish the new record. Absolutely. And this unless is a, it's terrible. It's not going to be terrible. It's J.J. Abrams. Is, you know, it could be terrible. Let me rephrase this. This is the long-awaited sequel to Return of the Jedi. That's right. The most, you're right, the most successful franchise of all time. Sequel. We are two weeks away from being 100 days away from the movie. <laughs> that's, 104, <laughs> that's 114 days by my, yeah, ma- yeah, my, yeah, my yeah, account. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are your what are your what are your viewing plans? You're going to go to a midnight IMAX. That's my question for you guys. It sounds like it's going to be hard to get a good seat anytime in the first couple of weeks. I mean, how do you, are they on sale? Or well, no, no, no. I'm just thinking it's going to be a order popular as film. As soon as they're on sale, buy a block of five seats and buy three showings opening weekend. So, but you have to go to a theater where you can get reserved seating for that. Yes, which for IMAX in San Francisco, thankfully you can. Yeah, is that true for all? But yeah, do we have more than one IMAX? We only have the one in the city, and I believe there is a LIMAX across the bay. And well, there's it, a LIMAX at uh, at Van Ness, isn't there? Maybe there's a IMAX in Venice as yeah. well. Is any of the film being shot in IMAX? I do not believe it's so. It's best not to ask those kinds of questions. Just get your money out and get it ready to spend. Right. Yeah. If you buy more than one ticket, I don't think you're going to have any problem either finding a friend to take that ticket or offloading that uh, ticket. Here's are, the thing. Are they going to make me watch it in 3D? You can, you, know, you can take the lens out of two glasses and switch one. I do know that. Yeah. And, yeah, we did a video about that. Roger Ebert linked us. But then you're watching a movie with sunglasses on, and That's I'd rather the, not do that. They're, they're bright enough now. The IMAX screen is, double? is bright enough. For well, no, you're still only looking through one filter. You're just, you just have two 2D glasses instead of one 3D glass. Right. You're both watching left eye. One person's watching left eye. One person's watching right I eye. I think 3D will be fine. 3D and IMAX is always fine. JJ has a good record with IMAX. JJ's with 3D. never done 3D, if I'm not mistaken. Really? Yeah. I don't think either the Star Trek's was 3D. I thought Into Darkness was 3D. Uh, it was post, though. It was post-converted. I have a Blu-ray 3D that's of Into Darkness. Oh, you do? Yes. Because I'm a fool. <laughs> On two fronts. Huh. Uh, I think that's it for us this week. Uh, let's play a little tiny bit of music and talk about what we've been testing. Uh... I've been testing smart things. It's really good with the Echo. Highly recommend it if you have smart things or an Echo. Do you have the new smart things? Uh, it's not out yet. Okay. I have pre-ordered it. Uh, they That thing has been delayed. That was originally supposed to come out in, I think, March or April because they announced it at CES. So uh, I'm, I'm about to set up a Wink hub in my house, which is the other big competitor to smart things in terms of home automation that doesn't have a monthly fee attached to it. 
Uh, and I want to see if Wink is any better. It's a part of a, a GE and I think Home Depot consortium. If people are waiting to adopt smart things, uh, should they wait for the new one? And what does the new one offer? And so the things that the things that the new one offers are uh, right now, if your internet goes down, the first gen box is basically useless because it does everything. All of the logic happens on servers someplace else in the internet. The new one will run your basic functionality uh, locally as long as it has power. So uh, the stuff like, oh, it's seven o'clock at night. We should change from daytime mode to nighttime mode. Or, hey, you, you, uh, you know, there hasn't been motion in your kitchen in the last 45 minutes. Put it in bedtime mode. Stuff like that. Uh, and I think you can also plug in a USB device for some reason. I'm not sure exactly why you do that. Battery backup is built in as well, I believe. Norm, what have you been testing? Anything? Uh, nothing much this week. <laughs> I feel like I did something else. <laughs> nothing. Jeremy? You've been testing hot air balloons. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, R- riding a hot air balloon. I upgraded my monitors for the first time in about Ooh. 10 years. What'd you get? I got two um, Dell UltraSharps, uh, the U2515Hs, which is the, um, so the 2K 20, 2560 by 1440. Yeah. Yeah, they, they call it Quad HD because it's like Quad 720p. And That's kind of bullshit, right? Because HD is 1080p. Right. Yeah, it is bullshit. Yeah. Absolutely. Wait, um, so 25, 20, 2560 by 1440, which is but only a 25-inch version of that. Yes. So, so it's, it's pretty good. high it's pixels. That's very good. sharp. Yeah. And two of them side by side, and the new Dells have very small bezels. So Are I you doing them horizontally or vertically? Like Horizontal. Huh. And uh, I, it's the first time I've ever experienced the magic of DisplayPort. Oh, DisplayPort's great. It's one cable. Yeah. C- it can power both of these very high high resolution monitors. Yeah. So I'm very impressed. You just daisy chain them? Yeah. 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 And it's it's really cool. I mean, I have had one go out a few times, but I recently upgraded my BIOS and hopefully I'm solving those problems. I don't know why the BIOS would do it, but hoping that's it. And um yeah, that's it. I mean, super cool. Um I also tried out some new filament with my 3D printer by, from Hatchbox, which gets a lot of good reviews. I had bad bad times with the gray Hatchbox stuff that I oh, bought you did. before. What I do like about it though, I've had good experience with yellow and green. And it's it's spot on measurement. It's spot on diameter. Yeah. No filament I've had has been this close to 1.75 millimeters. The problem I had with that was that it bubbled. Um but it could have been that I was running it too hot and it was also this was probably uh, it was right after we built the the simple, uh, the simple metal. Yeah. So I mean, it's a while ago. Well, I like it. Good to know. I'm thinking about just refreshing my whole filament collection with one brand. And okay. Just go in Hatchbox. It's not a bad. Like, like, it's a good way to go. Yeah, it just seems like consistency would be in, in my favor. Yeah, and it means you don't have to use the the calipers as often, which is nice. Right. Um, I feel like I've been testing something else, but I can't I can't remember what it is. I did some Steam Link streaming, not Steam Link streaming, but st- Steam OS streaming. Um, and I did that with a new AC router. So I've been streaming games from my Steam, my gaming PC in the in the office. It's wired into the network to yeah. a Surface Pro Three, sitting in bed with an Xbox One controller. That is a phenomenal experience. Doesn't really get as hot as putting an Xbox in your lap. No, well, and it doesn't. There's the lag is way better than any other wireless streaming I've done. Um, the AC has like seven. I have like a 700 megabit connection when I look at the Wi-Fi monitor. So you're getting really good performance. Uh, I am I am a fan of that thing. Spe- um, speaking of those, I recently installed a um, a pro uh, wireless access point at our pinball league sp- oh, okay. spot um, from a company called Ubiquity Networks. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah. Um, I love it. What it's makes great. it pro? I guess it has a lot of antennas in it, and it's very high power. It's the kind of thing where you don't want to um, have it near uh, within six feet of people. Okay. Because wow. it's, it's so powerful yeah uh and w- i was getting wi-fi access across the street where beforehand i didn't even know wi-fi existed. so you're oh. just plugging it into an ethernet port um yeah. on uh that's on the network from a switch yeah it's 200 bucks so it, a lot of people are oh, using them cheap. in their house as well yeah and oh. it's, it's extremely powerful you and, have a lot uh, of people in your house storm that's a fantastic i might want to get one of those for downstairs is it n or ac it's it's well it's got to be it's got to be know. ac it's got to be n think, uh, well uh, for 200 bucks cannot be within six feet of people makes it just put it up on the scary. ceiling. It has both antennas. It has both 5 and 2.4 gigahertz antennas. That's nice. I'm not sure about the, uh, the AC. I mean, I have so many extra routers I can use as repeaters. But, but what's cool is that it uses um, power over, over Ethernet, which it comes oh. with an adapter for that, too. So mm-hmm. just one cable, and you're good. That's how I power the switch that's under my house, is I have power over Ethernet coming from the garage for the into switch. the switch. Because oh, I didn't cool. have power in the, in the crawl space. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know what else I tested? I tested more game streaming. I tested the Windows 10 
Xbox One to PC streaming the other day. Um, I was playing a game called uh, um, the the it's the heist game. It's a roguelike about stealing stuff with Victorian robots. Um, shit, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, you don't mean volume. No, no, no. Else. It's it's new. It's an Xbox only game because I oh, have volume on okay. PC. Uh, it's really good. It, it works really well. The video quality. I was streaming at 1080p across a wired wired to wired, obviously, which is the only way a sane person is going to do that. worked worked really well. Uh, the only thing that bummed me out is that you can't. Like watch TV in the living room and then play the game in the other room. You you only have the one frame buffer. So, whatever you see on in the living room, you're gonna see on the yeah. on the on the stream box. And if you try to do something like stream Netflix or HBO Go or I think even TV, it says, "Hey, well, you're not allowed to do this. You can't you can't stream TV or Netflix. Just watch <laughs> it. You have a you're on a computer. Just use the browser." <laughs> so you know that's good to know. Yeah. Um, and I think that'll do it for us this week, unless anybody else has anything they want to talk about testing. Uh, if you, uh, where can people find you, Jeremy Williams? Um, at Jerware on Twitter, and that's J E R W A R E, not W E A R. <clears throat> nope. Somebody uh, tweeted me. It said it took him a while to find me, so now I'm, I'll spell it for you. Okay, Norman Chan, you're at N Chan. At N Chan. Uh, and I'm at Will Smith. Uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of This Is Only a Test. Today's outro comes to us from KJN. Uh, we need more outros, so if you want to find out how to submit them, go to uh, Google Raw Outro Song File, and I will upload a new version of the outro song later today. Uh, see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hi there. I didn't see you. Passed it. Wow, I'm all over the place today. Burn it all down. <laughs> Yeah,